All right, Kanch, and we are live. All right, thank you, Rashi. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, second Amsha Star Party from San Jose Astronomical Association. We are really glad that all of you are joining us. Some of you might have joined us for our first event. Some of you, this may be the first time you are seeing this event. Uh, either way, we have a great program lined up for you and stick around. Uh, before we get started, I want to give you a couple tips to enjoy this program a little bit better. Uh, first, go try to find the dark theme in the YouTube and try to turn it on. And if you happen to have a desktop uh, with other bright objects behind uh, the, your uh, web browser and try to turn them off or make your web browser full screen because we're going to be showing objects with a dark background, this will make it the experience better for you. Um, the second tip I want to give you is to go to your YouTube uh, quality settings and try to pick 720p or higher setting. Uh, we'll be showing you um, very dim objects and, uh, uh, and, uh, and having this high quality will help you to enjoy the program better. All right, so those are my two tips. Um, before we get started with the main program, um, I would like to introduce our club and talk a little bit about the club. Um, I'm sure most of you have, uh, many of you have attended our events before and, and already know about the club, but we always get members who are uh, public who are coming new to this program. So this is mainly for those folks. Uh, San Jose Astronomical Association or SJA in short, we were established in 1954. We are primarily an educational organization geared towards astronomy and related sciences. And we do, we have about 400 members currently and we do uh, many, many different events for the public and for our members. I'll first go through the public programs that we offer. We have, we have many public star parties we do. Um, uh, we have uh, star parties that we do in our main headquarters, which is uh, located in San Jose Hogi Park. California. We do uh, what we call uh, in-town star parties about a couple times a month. We do dark sky star parties. Uh, it's called a starry night star party that we do once a month in Rancho Cañada in south of San Jose. We do that with uh, in conjunction with the Open Space Authority in Santa Clara. Um, and we also have a tons of uh, other star parties that we do, like the uh, we have solar events, solar star parties. We do a binocular stargazing, uh, we have uh, pinnacles, the national park star party and whatnot. We can, I can keep going on those ones. We also do school star parties specifically for school children in the local area. So those, most of all those events we do when we are normally doing in person, uh, right now it's a special situation. So we are bringing some of these events um, um, to an online format. Um, so after the star parties, we also, we have uh, public talks we do. We have introductory talks we do a couple times a month. And we also have what we call uh, 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 guest speaker talks that we invite authorities in the subject of uh, astronomy or related sciences and ask them to talk to the members and to the public. So it's free for the public to attend. Beyond that, we have um, equipment help, help we provide for the public. We do uh, swap meets. Uh, where the public can come and exchange astronomy gear or exchange or buy and sell astronomy gear. Um, and lastly, we have a newsletter that we publish uh, three, uh, every three months. So I'll encourage you to check all those things out and that's free for public. Beyond that, we have for our members, uh, we have special programs. We have imaging workshops that we do for members. We do beginner training for our members. Uh, we have equipment lab, uh, equipment loaner program where you can borrow astronomy equipment for our members. And we also have a library, you can borrow books. Um, lastly, we have special, what we call a private observing events that we do um, for uh, our members. So we can open up dark sky sites at night and, and our members can go as a group and enjoy. Um, all of these for uh, the price of $20 a year. And if you enjoy what we do um, for the public, uh, I'd encourage you to go and check out and, and try to become a member. You can find us on sjaa.net um, and we also advertise our public events at meetup.com. All right, so that's the introduction. Next, um, I would like to introduce you to the, uh, the host for today. Um, we are all volunteers. I would like to take a moment here to mentioned we are not professional astronomers. 
but among us uh, we have probably years of experience in different parts of astronomy as as mh astronomers and we would like to bring at least some part of that knowledge to you today and hopefully you can enjoy that my name is kanch um, i typically organize intern staff parties for the club and i also run the lunar telescope program for our members um, and we have call here and rashi call and rashi are leaders for our uh, Starry Night Star Party that we do once a month. Uh, Nancy here is uh, is a uh, volunteer for our solar events and events like this one today. Then we have Glenn and Bruce. Glenn and Bruce are our imaging program leaders. Uh, you will catch them in, in, in doing a number of imaging programs for our members and to the public. And uh, imaging program is quite, uh, quite big in our club, being in the Silicon Valley. So if you're interested in that, uh, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, by the way, the imaging means astrophotography. Um, then we have these members, uh, Nicola, Joe, uh, Francisco. These are our imaging program members who are volunteering today uh, to bring some of the views that they have to you. Um, then I would like to introduce uh, Sukada. Sukada is uh, one of our board members and the person who organizes our monthly uh, guest speaker programs. Uh, and comes Wolf. Wolf is our solar program leader. And also, Wolf does the Astronomy 101 talks for our club. Lastly, but uh, last but not least, we have Swami. Swami is the board member and a former president of the club, and he's uh, involved with um, many of our programs that we, we conduct. Okay. And throughout this program, you will get to see uh, some, of, some of us uh, through, the, uh, uh, through the videos here. And uh, okay. Before we get started for the rest of the program, I do have to share a, uh, a sad note here. Marilyn Perry, who was a longtime member of the club, uh, passed away on July 4th. Um, uh, some of you may have met her, or maybe you don't know that you met her because most of our staff parties, she was a volunteer and she had a passion for, for the uh, astronomy subject not only to learn by herself and also to communicate what she learned to others, other people. And we had seen her doing many, many star parties and especially for the school star party program that we had. And we do dearly miss her. And this program today is dedicated for her. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay. Now to today's plan. First, we will have Nancy. Uh, take you on a sneak peek on of what to come for today. Just to give you a flavor of what's in this program. And then we will have uh, Rashi and Carl who will come in and uh, do a guided tour of the night sky for you today and uh, using Stellarium. And you'll enjoy, I hope you enjoy that. Um, then we'll take a quick break um, and we'll do a quick Q&A. Um, I'd like to remind to you at this time, there is a YouTube chat open, and please send your questions early, and um, when we can we can try to get to one or two of those questions right after the the night sky segment of the program, and then we will have a Q and A session at the end of this. Uh, we'll get to that, and and there we will answer the rest of the questions. All right. Next, uh, we have Amchi observing. This is where we will be showing. Um, uh, objects uh, both live as well as the stock pictures that our members has taken and we had chosen brand new objects for today's program so I'd encourage you to stick around until uh, that program comes online because we had to wait a little bit until the sky is dark and we can show you these objects better. One last thing here um, we have some a little bit of a surprise at the very end of the observing so we're not going to say what it is and uh, hopefully you can stick around until until then and you'll see what it is. Lastly, we have the Q&A and wrap up. Um, Q&A, we will take your questions and we will try to answer as many questions as possible as a panel. Okay, Nancy, could you please take us to a sneak peek, please? Good evening. Hi, my name is Nancy. Welcome to Armchair Star Party. It's the best way to enjoy the night sky in the comfort of your home. Uh, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, let's see, currently the weather appears cooperating for the most part, but there's some clouds floating, but I think we should still be able to see some amazing celestial objects. Did you know that um, 
you can actually look at quite a few things in the sky with just a pair of binoculars, uh, mainly mostly planets. But for deep sky objects, you're gonna need a telescope, okay? And I do encourage you to go out and try to spot these um, night sky objects while they're still visible in the summer skies. Okay. Um, many of our speakers are setting up their equipment at the moment. And once the sky is at its optimum darkness, we will look at uh, some celestial objects live. Um, so on tap tonight, we're gonna to be talking about double star, something very interesting. If you've never seen it before, you definitely want to learn about it and take a look at it. And we'll go through that tonight. We'll talk about um, diffuse nebula, okay? It's basically a, fo a star forming region and there's really no well-defined boundaries to, uh, to a nebula, to a diffuse nebula. We'll talk about uh, open cluster, okay? Which is a group of a few thousand stars formed from the same huge mass of uh, molecular cloud. We'll probably give you an, 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 you'll probably get to see an example of maybe a bright star cluster from there, from that group. Um, so we're also gonna be talking about planetary nebula, which is just uh, remnants of, uh, of a death star, okay? And um, now when you talk about nebula and open cluster and all that, we'll, you can't forget galaxies. So we're gonna touch um, on galaxy as well, okay? Galaxies where there's a system of star, star uh, stellar remnants, gas, dust, dark matter, all that are bounded together by gravity. Okay, so um, let's see, let's see if, uh, if I can have the image uh, on screen here. If you look at the image um, right there uh, on the top row, the second image right there, you can see that. That is a very famous image captured by NASA. And we're gonna be talking about that as well. So quite a few things we get to enjoy. And toward the end of the night, there will be a bonus surprise waiting for you. So stick around. Um, Joe will be uh, presenting this portion and he has a very interesting setup. I was able to see it and I thought it was so cool. I'm very excited that you get to see that tonight. That's true. I forgot to say that Joe is waiting in an undisclosed location for- That's right. Um, so at this point, I think I'm gonna check in with a few speakers and see if we can take a look at their equipment, okay? I'm probably gonna pick on Glenn first. So Glenn hosts a, uh, the hands-on imaging program like um, uh, Kanch mentioned earlier. And his setup currently is a semi-permanent setup at home in a white light pollution zone. But Glenn is able to work, find ways to work around that and still give us some amazing views, okay? And I'm hoping that Glenn is ready. Glenn, um, well, yeah. I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, let me uh, grab the presenting here. So yeah, there's some clouds here and I'm in the East Bay and we have some, some clouds tonight, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to peek between them. Uh, and you can see my, my telescope here. Let me move it for you. Uh, we'll go ahead and point at the first object here. Um, so I'll start it moving and then go back to the camera. Here you see it getting ready to look at, at uh, the first object we'll show in a, in a little bit, the uh, wild duck uh, cluster, or it's the first object for, for me on my telescope anyway. Um, yeah, so I am here in the middle of uh, a Union City in a white zone, but by using filters and uh, taking really long exposures, much longer than you would take at a dark site, uh, I am able to, to image from here from the comfort of my uh, office control room, uh, which you can see here on the screen, all the different things. Um, so that's, that's what I do from here, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you for the elaborate display and the walkthrough. Um, and um, we're gonna see you again shortly in the yep. armchair observing segment. Yep. Okay. 
So next, I think I'm going to pick on Bruce. Now let's check in with Bruce. Bruce uh, hosts the Imaging Special Interest uh, Group, and um, and that's a very popular program, like uh, Kanj mentioned. And let's see, Bruce. Hey, how about you tell us the viewers a little bit about your equipment? Are you on? Hi. All yeah. Right. Can you guys see me? Um, well. Uh, you can probably see it behind me. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, what I have set up tonight is a 152 millimeter refractor, which uses, <clears throat> excuse me, uses lenses uh, rather than mirrors that um, Glenn is using um, for focusing the light and gathering the photons and um, bringing the, the heavens closer to you. Um, it's a portable setup. It's on a, a mount called a um, MX Plus made by a company called Software Bisc. And um, I use uh, Wi-Fi to communicate with it. And um, I use a program that came with the mount called the Sky X, which is a planetarium software like Stellarium. Uh, and uh, it drives the mount and acts as a driver for other software to interact with the mount and point it where it needs to be pointed and run the cameras and that sort of thing. I'm um, also using uh, something called PHD uh, for auto guiding, which helps you stay on target and keeps your stars nice and round generally. And, uh, and um, I think that's it for now. Yeah. All right, thank you, Bruce. Thank you for showing us your equipment and a walkthrough of that. It looks like pretty Guys, heavy equipment. Before, before we switch over to the next individual, Conch, can you stop sharing for a quick second so we can actually see a bigger view of uh, Bruce's rig? Bruce, if you don't mind sharing your camera one more time, would love to uh, see a close-up of that camera. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. Let's uh, get spotlight going on you. There you go. Hard to aim this thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's just give it a quick second for the feed to catch up. I'm sure we'll, everyone's able to see. There we go. Perfect. So that's a live view of his rig. Thank you, Bruce. Yep. Sure thing. All right. Thank you. That looks pretty heavy duty. Um, and as you can see, we have two different setups. Uh, Bruce's setup is, is quite different from uh, Glenn's, okay. How about let's check in on one more uh, telescope, okay. Uh, let me take a look here, see who I should check on. Let's check in with uh, Nicola. Nicola is a very contributor and hopefully he has his rig set up and give us a quick walkthrough. Nicola, you're on. Yes, I'm on, yes. <laughs> I'm here, yeah. So, I'd like to show you my rig. Um, it's actually, I'm putting camera to it. So let me share my screen. Okay. All right. So can you see the screen? All right. So I'm going to shine the light on the telescope. It's right here. Can you see it? Here. Uh, I'm just next to it. So this is a 61 millimeter William Optics um, refractor. It's a very similar telescope like uh, Bruce, except the difference is that it's actually very wide field, field of view, which allows me to actually take very large images, um, particularly nebulas. Um, and it's actually a light telescope, which uh, helps to actually take very long exposures, um, exposition times. I'm also in a white area, uh, white sky with very high light pollution, but the telescope has uh, specific filters which actually cut off the light pollution and um, the only remaining light is from the nebulas. And that allows me to actually take images from, uh, from the nebulas. Uh, and today I'm going to show you one of them. And um, Nancy, so. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for showing us your rig. Um, so as you can see, there are many choices when it comes to selecting a telescope, okay? Now that we have seen three different telescopes from the outside, what about the inside of a telescope? Well, for this part, I'll ask Kanch to give us an overview. Kanch? Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Right. Um, 
yeah, just like uh, how uh, Nicola uh, and Bruce showed, those are called the refractor telescopes. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have already seen telescopes before, and some of you are probably already know how they work. But we always, in our start part, is we always get folks who are very new to the this subject and I uh, don't know how they work and what they're about. So I want to take one example of the ones that Nicola showed a refractor telescope and kind of give you a few minutes introduction how this thing works. So this is what he showed a, a, a refractor telescope and you probably have seen this in pictures or department stores and whatnot. It's usually it's a basically a long tube here and if you look at the front of the tube you will see uh, a lens and in the back of the tube you would see another uh, glass element and, and some knobs there to, to move things around and the whole apparatus uh, sits usually sits on top of a tripod. And the second slide here um, would explain how this thing works. Now if you go outside in a dark sky and you look up uh, using your eyes um, you're the light that's coming from the celestial objects enter your eyes um, uh, from two of your pupils are pupils and the pupils are not as, no bigger than about uh, five or six millimeters in diameter. That's just like like having two little straws uh, and having the light enter through those two straws. Instead of doing that, you could use the telescope to gather a lot more light and then funnel it to your eyes. So you actually gather a, a, a lot more information there. So here, um, let see, let me get this pointer. So here you can see the lights coming from a far away object. In this case, it looks like a galaxy here and it's entering the telescope, the front of the telescope. And you have a lens here. What the lens does is this is a, um, a convex lens. And what it does is it brings the lights to a focus point in the back of the telescope. So now you funnel this big, a, a big bucket of light into a small point and after that, you have another piece of this little glass element on here. What it is, is what we call it an eyepiece. What it does is it's kind of acts like a magnifying glass and a focuser. So you can actually move this back element back and forth until you get the right focus uh, and right level of magnifi magnification. So normally this back element can be, uh, is a removable element in our telescopes where you can get different levels of magnification. So by gathering a lot of light, and being able to magnify that light and you can see dim objects and and you can see the details of it. You need to see the details because even a bright object like moon, um, unless you actually zoom into it, uh, you can't really see the details. So this is the, the basic uh, way a telescope works. And here we are just showing it using a refractor type. Um, but if you go to a star party, you would see different types of telescopes. They essentially works the, uh, under the same principle, but they are just, the design is, is different. So that's a quick introduction. And uh, Nancy, back to you. Thank you, Kanch. Uh, that was quite informative. Um, so now that you've got a, uh, uh, you got a glimpse of these equipment and a brief understanding of how they work, in a little while, we'll get to see these telescopes in action, okay? So um, if you're new to this, when we talk about stars, night sky, astronomy, there's so many questions come to mind as to let's say where to start, what to look for, how to spot a star, and what can we see in the night sky, etc. We hope to answer some of these questions in our next segment, the night sky, okay? So let me introduce Rashi and Carl, the night sky team. Okay, Rashi, Carl, I'm handing the mic to you. Awesome, thank you, Nancy. All right, so let me go and go ahead and share my screen over here. Let's get the show started. All right. Hey guys, thank you for joining. We've got a great show for you tonight. Um, Carl and I are gonna co-host this uh, segment of the show tonight. Carl, you wanna go ahead and say hello to our viewers? Hey, what's up? <laughs> Indeed, what is up? And I think that is the title of our next slide. Um, so Carl, what is up in the night sky? Well, there's a plethora of stuff up there tonight. In other words, there's a lot. You're absolutely right. There is a lot. There's a whole universe of a lot up there in the night sky. And we're just scratching the surface with what's on this slide. And, and you know, we have to narrow things down because we're limited on time. 
Uh, but let's get started. Let's take a look at our solar system, right? When we look at our solar system, what are the, some of the things that we are able to see right away or notice? Of course, we see the sun during the day, right? Bright and shiny in the night sky, illuminating the night sky. So our solar system happens to be a one star system. Our sun is a yellow dwarf. It is a star and our uh, system is a one star system. Now, of course, with that, we have planets. We have eight major planets and a couple of uh, dwarf planets or minor planets. And with these planets, we have moons. Mars has two moons, right? We have one moon, which we get to see pretty much almost every night, except on new moon, right? And we've got Saturn in first place with 82 moons, with Jupiter in second place with 79 moons. In addition to moons, we get to see astro asteroids, we get to see satellites and comets. Talking about comets, there is a comet that's visible in July. Right now, you can go and take a look at it. You can find it in the evening sky or in the early pre-dawn sky. And we have a beautiful photograph from one of our members that we will highlight and showcase in just a couple of slides. Now, talking about stars, stars come in different configurations. We've got the one star system, but then you also have binary star systems. When you actually have two stars that happen to be gravitationally bound or seem to look like they might be gravitationally bound but are not. And the difference happens to be if they are gravitationally bound, we're going to use two oranges as an example right here. And if they're doing a gravitational dance just like that, then it is a true binary system. But if visually you get to see two very closely, but as you can see, they might be very far apart, those, those are called a visual binary. And then, of course, when, you, when we move over from binary star systems to multiple star systems, you can have three star systems, four star systems, and so on and so forth. Now, moving from that, stars also come in different other configurations called clusters. Nancy touched up on uh, clusters earlier on. She talked about open clusters and globular clusters. It's part of the sneak peek slide that you guys remember. So open clusters are anywhere from a few hundred to about a thousand stars that are loosely uh, coupled, uh, gra loosely gra gravitationally bound. They are social distancing of sorts, if you, if you want to look at it with the current climate. And then, you know, those are open clusters. And then globular clusters are these very dense spherical structures, very ancient structures in the night sky. They usually revolve around a galactic core like our galaxy. And we have about 150 that we've been able to identify to date. Uh, and those very, very dense, dense structures of anywhere from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, even up to a million stars, are the globular clusters. And then we move up to constellations. We're all aware of this, the 12 zodiacal constellations. There are about 88 uh, categorized or catalog constellations by the International Astronom Astronomical Union. And within these constellations, we see uh, human recognizable patterns, and those are called asterisms. And as you can see on the screen right now, We've got sort of kind of a pan and a pan handle, and that is in the Ursa Major, the Big Dipper constellation. We'll talk about that in just a couple of slides. And that's, that's a pattern that we, we get to see. If we were to take a look at Sagittarius, we would see the teapot in Sagittarius. And then, of course, you've got these dense structures of clouds, of stars called star clouds, and then you've got nebulas, and nebulas come in different, different varieties, and some of them actually happen to be stellar nurseries. And all of this is contained in massive containers called galaxies, and these galaxies come in different shapes and sizes. You've got spiral, barred spiral, elliptical, and irregular galaxies. Now, we happen to be in July, so let's talk about some of the July highlights. So, Carl, you want to help our viewers with some of the July highlights? Well, Jupiter and Saturn will be up above the horizon about 9 o'clock tonight. Well, actually, it's already past 9. Um, <clears throat> so, Saturn and Jupiter will be visible at 1.30 tonight. And, and I think what he means by that is uh, they'll be very high in the sky and very bright uh, past midnight. And uh, by mid-July, around 1.30 or so, what you're going to get to see that they happen to be their brightest. They will be in opposition to the sun. Back over to you, Carl. Okay, later Mars and Moon will be, will be up uh, about 4 o'clock later on this, this, uh, this morning if you're up. And then... Venus will be up also about uh, about that time, four to five o'clock, just before sunup. Now the Mars mission 2020 is going to take off, launch at the end, end of the month, about July July 30th, and is scheduled to arrive at Mars in February 18th in 2021. One of the missions is to collect 
rocks and soil samples and previous Martian rovers have uh, already collected samples and the scientists already know what the compositions of the Martian soil is. So with that in mind, I have a piece of Mars right, right there. Oh, wow, this, you got a Martian rock there, Carl. That's right. And this has uh, been found in uh, Northwest Africa. It was blasted off of Mars about, well, millions of years ago. And it landed maybe a thousand years ago and was picked up by nomads. And then, you know, I, ha I have it. Um, Carl, how much, how much did you bribe them for that piece of rock? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Um, dang. The Summer Triangle is, uh, will be up. So Vega, Deneb, and Altair. If you come outside tonight and look up, try and find the Summer Triangle. And later on, Rashi is going to talk a little bit more about that. Cool. Thank you. Oh, Thank Rashi, you, 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 there's another object up in the sky later on in the morning. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We talked about comets. So here we have a beautiful image taken this morning. It was taken this morning at around 4.30 a.m. by an SJA member, Nick Hill, a member and a friend from uh, the Fossil City Trails looking northeast. It's, it's a comet called uh, uh, C2020F3-NEOVIS or Comet NEOVIS. It was found by the NEOVIS Space Telescope on March 27th. It will be the closest to Earth on July 23rd. Please make sure that you get to see it this month because it might not come back for another five or 7,000 years. So uh, it will be visible. It'll be at a magnitude of positive one, or plus one or plus two. It'll be visible to the naked eye. So pre-dawn around four or 4.30, you should be able to spot it. Or later at night or in the evening time, you might see it, but it'll be very, very, very low to the horizon. So you might need very clear skies uh, looking looking westwards or, or horizons. Uh, you might not see it in the evening time, but mornings definitely make it a point to go and take a look. Now, th this comet's gonna be very bright, but there's another object in the night sky that happens to be also very bright, and that happens to be our moon. And our moon goes through a variety of different phases as it orbits the Earth. So based on the position of the moon in its orbit around the Earth, we get to see the different phases. So Carl, what phase are we in right now? Well, we're in a phase where you got the arrow pointed, but I'm <laughs> glad you mentioned uh, the moon. There's another meteorite, lunar meteorite. Wow, you've got a moon rock too. That's right. And it's big enough that if you hold it up, up in the sky, it'll even cover the moon. So that's how big <laughs> my little tiny piece is. That is awesome. That is awesome. Um, so what is a waning gibbous? That's a very good question, and thank you for calling that out. So now for all the folks that grew up with uh, Karate Kid or have watched Karate Kid, we've got a reference right over here, Wax On and Wax Off, the iconic Karate Kid reference from Mr. Miyagi as he was training Daniel-san. So I've gone ahead and changed that a little bit to Wax On and Wane Off. And the way, and this has helped me learn the different phases of the moon. So when we go from new moon to full moon, we are waxing on. And then when we are going from full moon down to new moon, we are waning down or waning off. So let's go through these different phases. New moon, waxing crescent, waxing half moon, waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, waning half moon, waning crescent, and back down to new moon. So from this session, you should remember wax on and wane off. All right. Now let's talk about what else can we see with our eyes in the dark sky. When you happen to be in that inner city sky, you only get to see a few specks in the night sky, right? Otherwise, it's primarily the same kind of sheen across the night sky with just these few little dots, and that's all you get to see. But when you start moving out into suburban sky and that light pollution reduces quite a bit, you get to see a lot more in the night sky. And then getting out to an excellent dark sky site, there is so much more, so much more beauty that you get to see. Now, of course, what is that range? What is that limit, right? We get to see to a 
pretty much about a positive 6.5 magnitude. That's the limit of our eyes. And that number, that, that word magnitude is, or is the apparent magnitude. How bright or dim something looks to us while we're on Earth when we're looking at that object in the night sky. So there's a whole categorization of objects and what magnitude or apparent magnitude they happen to be. And we can only see roughly between 5,200 to 5,900 stars with our naked eyes, no assisted viewing, um, when we look at the darkest, excellent dark sky sight. Okay. Now, of course, there are a lot of other different factors that come into play as well. When we're in San Jose, there's a lot more light pollution. So we get to see somewhere slightly less than 600 stars in the night sky. But then we have to account for weather, cloud cover, different altitudes, humidity, wind, dust. We talked about eyesight. And then finally, if you happen to have aliens covering the night sky, then we've got other problems to deal with at that point. So make sure you pack up and, and run out the door with your bug out bag. And now let's get to the Stellarium map. So let me go ahead and switch over to the Stellarium app and we'll start walking through the night sky. All right, fabulous. So I have Stellarium up and running here on my screen. And let me, uh, let me make sure we've got the right time selected here. Yeah, we've got roughly about 9.30. Let's, let's make it 9.38, get it to exactly where we are. And uh, let's reorient ourselves just a bit. And I think I'm looking north. Carl, can you help me out here? To the unaided high, how would we find north? Well, first thing is look for the Big Dipper. But you got to help me out. Where is the Big Dipper? <laughs> we did talk about the pan and the pan handle, right? So let's go and find the pan. I think the pan happens to be right here. And then we've got the pan handle right over there. And of course, we've got two stars. Carl, do you remember those two stars, the pointer stars? What are those called? Uh, Merrick and Dubé. Yeah, they happen to be right here. And those are pointer stars. So if you draw a line from these pointer stars, an arrow, pretty much an imaginary arrow, it points to Polaris, the North Pole star. North Pole star is roughly about 432, 433 light years from us. Light years, the distance light travels in one year, and that's equivalent to roughly about 6 trillion miles. So we've got a large distance that light travels, and multiply that by 433, that's an even bigger number. Now, Polaris just happens to be next to our North Celestial Pole, so we call that the North Pole Star. Now, we are in a planetarium app, so we can turn on the constellation lines. Let's just go ahead and do that. I'll turn on the labels as well. And now you can see that there are constellations starting to form with these imaginary lines that otherwise we cannot draw in the night sky, but we can do so in a planetary app or planetarium. So we've got Ursa Major, we've got the, the pan and the pan handle, uh, which is about one third of the, the total, con the bigger constellation, Ursa Major, the big bear. And these pointer stars point to Polaris, which is a tail star of Ursa Minor, the, uh, the little bear. And you've got Draco the dragon, pretty much protecting Ursa Minor. Now, our ancestors imagined more than just these lines. They imagined art that would surround these stars. They stitched narratives and stories. They were the ancient storytellers. And because of them, we've got these constellations in the night sky, right? They stitch events, they stitch narratives all around uh, these, these, uh, these stars. So let's see what they imagined. So now with the constellation art turned on, you can see the big bear, you can start visualizing this. You've got Ursa Minor, the little bear, and you've got Polaris at the tail end. You've got Draco the dragon. And then you've got a few other different creatures and, and uh, constructs, people and whatnot around uh, the night sky. And the big bear, or Ursa Major, the pan of the panel is a great anchor constellation to start off with because then you can get to multiple different locations in the night sky. So Carl, where should we go next? Well, I've always wanted to learn more about Canis and Odyssey. And I hear it's not really an ancient uh, constellation, but I'd like to learn a little bit more of that. Canis Minotisi is the hunting dogs, right? So from Ursa Major, let's go ahead and get the, uh, the arrow tool back out. From Ursa Major, we were able to get, from the pointer stars, we were able to get to Polaris and find Ursa Minor, right? If we continue to go further, we'll get to Cepheus, 
the mythical king of uh, king of Ethiopia. But right below this pan hand, uh, panhandle, right below that, we've got uh, the hunting dogs, Canis venatasi. Now, we'll come back to Canis venatasi for in in a second. But where else can we go from the panhandle, Carl? Well, if you follow the arc on a panhandle, you run smack dab into Arcturus and Bodies. Yeah, we get to Arcturus and Booties, and Booties is the herdsman. But if you were to draw a line between the stars, it looks sort of kind of like a kite uh, with Arcturus at the, the, the tail end of the streamer end. But then there's another another um, verse to that line, Arc to Arcturus, and then... Spike on. Spike to... down to? Spica. Yeah, spike on or spike down to Spica. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's spike down to Spica in Virgo. Right. So when you guys go out tonight, Arc to Arcturus, Spike to Spica. So you'll be able to get to the Buddhist translation, and then you'll be able to get to the Virgo translation, Lady Virgo. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and make sure everyone else is muted. OK. Now, um, what was next to Canis Venatasi that we wanted to take a look at, Carl? Well, here there's a pretty neat looking galaxy there. M it's, a spiral, it's, a, it's a spiral galaxy, right? Yep. All right. So let's go ahead and I'm going to bring up my bookmarks because I know I have it bookmarked here somewhere. And I'm going to turn the constellation art off. And uh, oops. Now let's just go ahead and zoom right in. We should be able to see a little bit of that spiral galaxy. Now, Keep in mind that some of the, the items that we're showcasing right here in between the constellations, these are all part of what's coming up in the next segment, the armchair observing segment. And we're gonna be stitching another narrative to help you understand a little bit more about these objects. And of course, we'll be doing, uh, based on the weather, we'll be either showing you stock images or we'll be actually looking at some of these live. All right, where do we wanna go next, Carl? So I know we, we're right between Canis Venatasi and Ursa Major. I think there's a double star somewhere here as well, right? Well, if you go up to Bodies, there, are, there is a pretty neat looking double star named Izar. And that happens to be on the left edge. So if we go from Arcturus, we go one up to the next brightest, and that happens to be Izar right over there. Uh, Izar is a beautiful double star. We'll get to see it has a beautiful golden and a smaller white our companion. That's all. I'll leave it at that, and then we'll get to the next item. Where do we want to go next, Carl? Well, you want to talk about Arcturus? Oh, yes, of course. Arcturus happens to be an orange giant, right? That's right. It's a red-orange star about 37 light years away. It's uh, about 7 billion years old with a mass of uh, about one-tenth of our own, greater than our own sun. So when you step outside to look at Arcturus tonight, you're looking at how our sun might look like in about two and a half billion years from now. Yes, absolutely. And then guys, do not, do not forget, we find the Big Dipper, the pan and the pan handle, and then we follow the arc down to Arcturus. Okay, the next item that we have is near Hercules, I believe. Am I right, yep, Carl? Yeah, Hercules. Okay. So let's go ahead and move things around just a little bit. Oops. We are a little stuck. There we go. Now we're in the right orientation. So you did say that the, the summer triangle was coming up in the night sky. And I'll just give a quick reference of the summer triangle because um, it's, there's an easy way for us to traverse through a bunch of different constellations from Arcturus. So let's turn on, let's turn on the asterisms. And you know, Arcturus is all the way up here. Uh, let me go ahead and put a stamp right over there. So Arcturus is right over there. And then summer triangle happens to be right here. And you can see this little, you can see this triangle. We've got three stars in three different constellations. Vega, the harp star in Lyra, the harp. 
the neb, the pale star of the swan in Cygnus the swan. And then we've got Altair uh, near the heart of uh, Aquila, the, the, uh, the eagle. Let me turn the constellation arc on for a second. And uh, we should be able to see. So we've got um, booties up here. We've got Corona Borealis in the Northern Crown. We've got Hercules. And then we've got the Summer Triangle. So when you're trying, when you're moving from Arcturus all the way down to Vega, that's a great way to, to traverse through Corona Borealis, which is the Northern Crown. So let's take a look at that. And it looks like a big smiley face in the night sky. So of course, you know, if anybody's out there and you're not feeling that great, just get out there and find this big smiley face in the night sky and you'll always cheer up. Does, does it for me. And then right below Corona Borealis, heading towards Vega, you've got Hercules. You've got this massive keystone of Hercules. Of course, the keystone is that main rock, main uh, stone in the archway of any, uh, of any archway. That's the main uh, stone that if you take out, the entire archway will fall. So guys, please do not take the, uh, the keystone of Hercules out of the night sky. The night sky will fall on us. No, I'm just kidding. And then, of course, as you come down to Vega, the Harp Star, you can then easily get to the Summer Triangle. M92, it was that we were looking at, or what we're going to look at. M92, what is it, Carl? It's a globular cluster. And we talked about globular clusters being ancient clusters of uh, large numbers of stars. Do you remember how many stars this one happens to have? Well, it's about 330,000 minus, uh, minus 10 or 20 uh, stars. Uh, 300, 330,000 stars. Wow, yeah. that's, that's a lot. That definitely is a lot. Yep. And again, a lot of these objects will be coming back to uh, when we get to the armchair observing segment. Next, let's uh, zoom back out again and uh, get to the Summer Triangle. The next one happens to be a planetary nebula uh, within the confines of the Summer Triangle. So I'll open up the, uh, the asterism chart up here as well, the triangle, so you can see the triangle. Uh, which one was it, Carl, that we wanted to get to? Well, let's see. M27 is up there, so I think that's the dumbbell, is it not? Yes, it is the dumbbell nebula. So let's take the uh, constellation arc off. Let's zoom in just a bit. We've got a beautiful uh, nebula right over here, the Dumble Nebula. We'll talk more about that in the, the next segment. But what you can definitely see here, it's within the confines of the Summer Triangle. And from the head of the swan, which is Alberio, a double star, and we'll cover that in the next star party. As you move down to Aquila, you'll pass two other constellations, smaller constellations, and that is Velpecla the fox and Sujita the arrow. And right in between is where you will find M27. M27 also happens to be a binocular object. Same thing with M92, the globular cluster. You should be able to see both of them with binoculars. A little small, uh, but you definitely will be able to see them. And the next is a supernova remnant, right, Carl? Yep, in Cygnus. Let's go in there. Cygnus, the swan. Yes, the Cygnus, the swan on the right wing coming off. You should be able to go right off of that middle section and notice a very, very, very faint, of course, here we've got a color image, but we'll be looking at this segment, the, the Western veil, the Western segment of uh, this supernova remnant tonight. Let's zoom back out. So that, that way you can see the placement of it. Again, the summer triangle, we've got Vega right up there. We've got Deneb, the tail of uh, the swan. Altair, the heart of the eagle, and on the right wing of Cygnus the Swan, we've got uh, the Veil Nebula, the Western Veil, or the entire Veil Nebula, and then we will just will be focused on the the Western part of it, which has multiple different names, and we'll get to that. What's next, Carl? Where do we want to go next? Well, let's go to uh, Scudum. This is a neat looking loose uh, loose bunch of stars there, this cluster. It's the salt and pepper cluster, and I think it has another name. Do you remember the other name? Yeah, wild duck. The wild, wild duck cluster. Duck cluster. <laughs> Why is it called the wild duck cluster? Do you know? Well, it kind of looked like a flock of ducks flying, flying up in the air. So they called them flying ducks. 
Oh wow. Okay. All right. I'll zoom in one quick second, but let's take a let's do an orientation. So we've got the the summer triangle. We've got Aquila the eagle, right? And as we move um, to the right of the Aquila the eagle, we have another form of four stars uh, that form Scutum the shield. All right. So in between these both, we will find the wild duck cluster, or pretty much in Scutum. But uh, you get the idea. So let's zoom in a bit. Turn the constellation art off. And as you can see, we've got an open cluster called the wild duck cluster um, and also the salt and pepper cluster. To me, it definitely does look like salt and pepper, but to some others, it might look like the wild, a flock of wild ducks in the night sky. And lastly, we're gonna get to the iconic Eagle Nebula. Where is that, Carl? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, it's in Serpens. Uh or in the tail, tail part of serpents, M16. On the tail part of serpents. Let's turn the constellation art on again. Serpent is a very large constellation. So you can see a fucus and you've got the serpent or serpents, pretty much you've got the tail end going all the way around, coming up top and you've got the head of the serpent. So you're talking about near the tail end. So somewhere between scutum and serpents, right? I think that's where it is. Yeah, they're right at the border. Right at the border. There we go. And the iconic pillars of creation that Nancy talked about earlier are part of the Eagle Nebula. And we'll touch base on that as well. We've got a beautiful image coming up in the observing um, armchair section. All right. So we've taken a look at a bunch of constellations. Uh, one other thing that I do want to point out, if we, let's turn on the cardinal points, and let's take a look at the south section right here, right? So uh, we were at Scutum, and then we can take a look at this teapot. This teapot's coming up. We talked about asterisms. This is the Sagittarius teapot. We'll get more into this in the next star party, and right next to it, we happen to have Scorpius, or, uh, the scorpion. Scorpion, for all of those that have seen Moana, uh, this is the Maui's fish hook. And in between Scorpius and Sagittarius, we happen to have our galactic center. Somewhere about there is the center of our galaxy. So now what we're going to do is we're going to turn the constellation art off. We're going to zoom out. And we're going to very quickly trace some of these items in the night sky. And let's see how your memory does, folks. I want you to follow along. I hope my memory serves me well. I am, I don't have any aids here, so let's do this. Pan and pan handle is what we started off with. So let's draw that out. We've got the pan and the pan handle. From the pointer stars, Moroccan Dube, we went to Polaris in Ursa Minor. Pol Polaris is a North Pole star, also the tail star of Ursa Minor. We've got Dra Draco the dragon, that goes ahead and surrounds Ursa Minor. Now, Moroccan Dube are the right two pointer stars. Right, the right two stars of the pan. But if you were to consider the left two stars of the pan, those would get you to the head of the, head of the dragon. If you went in the opposite direction, you would get to Leo Minor, which is the little lion, and then you would get to the big lion. I'll turn the constellation art on for a second, so you can see the the little lion and the big lion. Here you have you've got the little lion and you've got the big lion. We'll turn that off again. We'll come back to those in a second. From the arc, you can arc down to Arcturus, and then you can spike to Spica. And Spica is somewhere over there. Uh, I probably need to zoom out a little bit, but I'm going to lose some of my uh, my artwork. Oh, let's zoom back in. On the other side, if you were to continue from the pointer stars to Polaris and then go on a little bit more, oops, let's get that realigned. You would get to Cepheus. Okay. And then from Arcturus, you can get to Corona Borealis, go through Hercules, and then get to Vega. Once you get to Vega, you can then sketch out in your mind the Summer Triangle, which is between Vega, Deneb, and Altair across the three constellations of Lyra, Cygnus, the Swan, and Aquila. And of course, um, to the right of Aquila, as you continue, you can then get to Scutum. So let's draw that arrow out from here. Then you can get to Scutum. Now, if we 
And I am missing one more. Yes, from right below the panhandle, you can get to Cor Crowley and Kenneth Venatasi. Now, let's go ahead and try to place all the objects that we took a look at. So that way sort of kind of anchors in your mind before we get to the next segment. And I believe M106, we're somewhere over here between the pen and Kenneth Venatasi. Once we got to Arcturus, the double star Izar is the next bright one coming up on the left edge of the kite. Corona Borealis, the, the Northern Crown, the big smiley face right there. We've got Hercules, the keystone of Hercules. You can see right below Hercules was M92. From Cygnus, you get go to the head of the swan and then go downwards, you will cross Vilpecula and Sagita and somewhere over here with M27. Uh, next to the right wing of the swan was the Veil Nebula. And then moving from Altair towards Scutum, we found M11, which is the wild duck cluster somewhere about there. And between Scutum and Serpent, we would find uh, the Eagle Nebula somewhere about there. All right, folks. Now, since you have this on the screen, I would like for you guys to pull your, your phones out Take a quick picture. So when you go out tonight after the show, you can go and find some of the stuff. If you've got binoculars, you can try to find some of the some of the items that are visible by binoculars. But at least you'll be able to trace and find some of these constellations and learn more about the night sky. So Carl, big question for you, bud. How can we learn more about the night sky? Let me go ahead and clear the drawings here and get to the next slide, but please help our viewers out. Carl, you're on mute. All right, for, you could uh, read books, magazines, Google, sounds pretty good. Um, you could download Stellarium for free. You can uh, get star charts, printable star charts, which Rashi will tell you about a little bit later. Also, mm -hmm. these these little magazine inserts, I've been using these for years. These are pretty good to use. And also, you can join the SJAA. Yes, you can definitely join the SJAA, as Wolf says, for the price of one pizza, you get to be a member and enjoy its benefits. It's only $20, so definitely look at, you know, looking at what all Conch talked about, the benefits that you get. Please join the association, and there's so much to learn. There's so much fun that we have um, as an association. We do all these events. We do, you know, private events as well. There's a lot going on, a lot to learn, a lot to enjoy. Now, we talked about printable star charts. You can go to skymaps.com into the download section and download this, the sky map for either the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere for that specific calendar month. So this is for July 2020. As you can see, you've got you know um, all the constellations already laid out, uh, a lot more on that chart itself. And then there's a lot of text around it talking about what's in the night sky, uh, what you can go find, uh, where it might be, and of course, some more information on the back side or on the second page, uh, things that are easily seen with binoculars, telescopic objects, or items that are easily visible to the naked eye. So definitely, there's a lot of material out there. You've got books, you've got star charts, but if you want to quickly start tonight itself, you have a printer at home, or you just want to download this on your, on your phone, Go to skymaps.com, download the PDF, and get started. So we are done with our segment, and now we are going to go into quick Q&A. I'm going to stop sharing so we get to see everybody. And I'm going to give the floor to uh, Sukhada and Swami for questions. Hi there. Uh, so let's see, you guys have done a phenomenal job so far, and we are only halfway there. Uh, so we have two questions that we can answer in this mini Q&A, and then we will have more questions towards the end. Anna asked, uh, and this is for Kanch, I think, can you use the refractor telescope you showed during the daytime where there is more light? Okay, yeah, um, you can, uh, but there's a little bit of caveats. Uh, if you 
if you would like to see, uh, it depends on what you're going to look at. If you're going to look at uh, objects up in the sky, there's nothing to see other than the sun. And we highly recommend you do not do that because the telescope cannot handle it and you will get eye damage instantly. You need to use a special uh, covering to cover the telescope to look at the sun. However, if you want to use the telescope to see uh, uh, terrestrial objects, uh, you can do that. Uh, with a couple of caveats that I can mention quickly here. Uh, one is this telescope has a tendency to, to, to move the, uh, the object that you're looking at either upside down um, or left and right switched. So you, it won't be as enjoyable looking at it. So you need to get special uh, optical apparatus to make it uh, right side up image. Uh, so that's one. The other one you would probably see is the, uh, the what we call the, uh, a field of view, which is basically when you look through a telescope, you're going to see like a tunnel vision. So if you're going to look at a, a, a scenery far away, you know, you, you might only see a little piece of it. So it's not as enjoyable. Um, so for that, I would recommend a look for a pair of binoculars if you want to use for a daytime observing of terrestrial objects that will be easier to handle. You don't have to mount it. And you can also see a wider field of view. So Okay. That's yeah. cool. Thank you, Kanch. Uh, this next question is about the comet or rather photographing the comet. So we have been chatting a, lit a lot about uh, this wonderful comet we have in the sky right now, the Neowise. And Emma has a question about that. Uh, I guess if whoever has experience with photography can answer this. What lens have people been using to image the comet? I have a 50 mm and a 70 mm. Um, so what is your recommendation for Emma? I think it would depend on what you want in the background, right? Because it's uh, big enough to, to almost see with the, the naked eye, right? So you don't really need to zoom in that much. Uh, so it just depends on how much of the, you know, we showed that image, the wonderful image that was taken this morning where you had kind of the whole uh, bay uh, there in front of the of the comet. So it just depends on how zoomed in you want to be. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thank you, Glenn. If she has a follow up, I can pass that on. But I think those are the two questions we had for now. If you guys want to uh, go to the next section of the event. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Sekada. No worries. So uh, should I, um, so next one uh, would be our, let's try to share the screen here. The next section is the armchair observing. I'm waiting for the screen to come up here. Sorry. So this is for Glenn. Uh, Glenn, can you take over? Yeah, are there uh, one or two slides before the actual Stellarium yeah, part? Or... I'll start us off here. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hey, I'm Wolf. Good evening, you all. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us tonight at this armchair star party. I hope you're all learning something and having some fun. Um, and uh, so to keep going with that, let's see. I have a short little quiz for you here. Let's see, so here, what movie is this picture from? I bet you you can all recognize this, right? I'll bet you, I'll bet you a box of donuts that, that you guys all know what this picture is. And of course, there's this one as well, right? You know, if you put these two together, of course, they're from the whole, you know, Star Wars. Oh gosh, how many movies have we had? I guess six if we look at these, right? Um, and what, what's iconic about this, right? This is Luke Skywalker looking at the horizon on Tantamine, right? And there is this double sunset, you know, way back from the first movie. And then here, of course, uh, at the end, um, you know, again, he's looking at this double sunset. So, so yeah, there's a double star, right? So, you know, our world, of course, here, right? Here on earth, we see one star rising. We see one sun, you know, in the morning and then it sets in the evening. Uh, but it turns out that actually most stars out there in the, in the galaxy are multiples. They're actually not singles. Uh, our sun is somewhat of an anomaly in that sense. Uh, so it, there's actually a notion that maybe when our solar system formed, maybe our sun did have a companion and that companion might have been ejected into space. And it's possible that companion now wanders 
a galaxy on its own as a rogue star. There are such things. So we don't know if that happened, but it's kind of fun to think about. But the key message here is that, yeah, most stars out there are actually multiple stars. So singles like our sun are uh, somewhat of an uh, anomaly. So let's see, uh, let me hand it back to Bruce with that. And we are going to visit our first target for the armchair portion here. Yeah, I think you meant Glenn, but that's okay. I'm sorry, what did I say? <laughs> you said Bruce. I'm sorry, yes. No, I meant no worries. <laughs> okay, so let me just get us oriented here. So we're back in Stellarium again, and uh, this landscape uh, you may recognize if you've been to our star parties at Rancho Canada de Oro. Uh, the telescopes are normally set up here along this uh, split rail fence and looking south. Okay, but we're gonna orient you again back this other way to the north and uh, um, you know, here's Polaris that we learned how to how to identify, and uh, we're going to keep you focused on that. And one of the reasons that we like to uh, be focused on Polaris, especially those of us that are doing astroimaging, is because as as the night moves on, you know everything appears to rotate uh, around that point in the sky because that's the the north. And uh, so we need our telescopes to be aligned with that so that uh, when they turn, they turn with the, the motion of the, uh, of the stars. So with that, uh, let me go ahead and bring the first object up here for Wolf. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, Rashi already mentioned this a little bit when he gave you the overview of the night sky earlier. And by the way, if you're anything like me, you might have found that whole walkthrough of the night sky with all those stars and all those things on the sky map somewhat bewildering. I certainly felt that way when I started. So if you felt that way now, don't worry about it. If you like this stuff, stick with it. You'll figure this out and you'll get there. Um, so here, yeah, so here we're now back in this kite that uh, Rashi described earlier, Arcturus is kind of the base of it, and then one of the stars that, that is the outline of the kite is uh, a star we'll talk about here, uh, Izar or Izar. And uh, let me see, so let me actually go and switch to my setup, and interestingly, uh, I've been watching my feed from my telescope over the last hour or so, and every now and then the star kind of fades out. So that means one of two things. It's either clouds or aliens. I kind of wish it were aliens, but it's probably clouds. And actually right now we're, yeah, I see the star is kind of disappearing. But uh, so let's see, before we look at the star, then let me just quickly show you what we're using to look at the star. So here is a picture of the telescope that's sitting on my deck in the backyard. I have a laptop attached to it. You see a bunch of wires. And here's an 11 inch, uh, what's called a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with a camera stuck in the back. This setup is not nearly as fancy as some of the other imaging rigs uh, that, that we'll visit later in this segment. But nevertheless, you know, I can point it straight up at the sky at some nice stars and we can get some images out of it. And let's see. Um, okay, great. Looks like whatever aliens or clouds were in the way have moved a little bit. So right now, you know, what we're seeing is mostly just kind of a blob. But let's see, let's, uh, let's zoom in on this blob a little bit more and see what's going on because there's actually some interesting stuff to talk about. Oops, that was the wrong button. Of course, now I lost my star. There it Looks is. like aliens got it. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay, there we go. So, so you can see here, there is certainly a bright, yeah, actually now it's fading out again a little bit. So here our aliens or clouds are back, right? So there is a bright part and then next to it is right now kind of difficult to see fainter, smaller part. Um, so it looks like one star is actually pretty fat and round and the other one is a little bit uh, smaller, right? Now. Be, let's be clear, this is actually an artifact, right? From our perspective, all these stars that we see, and when we look at the night sky with the naked eye, the stars we see tend to be between, I don't know, uh, 10 light years, maybe a thousand light years away, roughly. So in that, in that range. And there's a few closer ones, but most of them are in that range. And they all pretty much look like pinpricks to us. So when the star has shape here, when it looks like it's actually a ball, it's an artifact. Uh, and, and for example, the artifact, I'll show you kind of where part of this comes from. If I change the exposure on the camera, notice what's happening. You can kind of see this, this light now dancing around, right? 
um, this is the atmosphere. So the air is turbulent. So the air is rising and it's actually taking the light beam that's coming from the star and it's causing it to twist and bounce and, and, and shake around. And that's making the image very jumpy. And so if we take an image of that and we average it over time, we collect light over an amount of time, it starts to look like a round blob, even though it is really just a point. There's the same effect that makes stars twinkle when you look at the night sky with the naked eye. Stars twinkling is the light being bent by the atmosphere. Um, oh yeah, so when we look at this here, we can see, now we can actually see it pretty well. There are two stars here, again, the, the big fat one that really shouldn't look so fat and the smaller one. The big one is actually a star that is, is kind of towards the end of its life. It's a star that has run out of hydrogen fuel. It is now at a phase where it's burning the helium that it created in the prior phase. And so, yeah, so this star is, is kind of on its way out. Uh, the star next to it, the, the little dot, that's a star that we call a main sequence star. It's a star that's currently still burning hydrogen, similar to our own sun. Now, uh, earlier we saw the picture of Tangerine, right? Luke Skywalker looking at the horizon. And there he saw two suns really close to each other. Turns out these two guys are actually really far away. Uh, these guys are, uh, let's see, I always forget my numbers. So I will cheat and I will look at my list here. Uh, these are about 185 astronomical units apart. An astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the sun. And so these two stars are 185 times the distance of the Earth to the sun apart. That's, that's bigger than our entire solar system. Um, so yeah, you know, this is not exactly like what we saw Luke seeing on the, uh, on the horizon. But nevertheless, it's very cool. And you know, just with a naked eye looking at double stars, you can do some basic science because the color of the stars gives you an idea of the temperature. So yeah, I think that is, uh, that's pretty cool stuff. So let's see. Okay. Let's see. Um, Glenn, if you'd like to switch it back. Okay. Um, so your right, see, I learn. You, you jumped ahead a little bit here. So, <laughs> so uh, what happens here in, in the solarium uh, is we're going to go to the constellation that Izar is in and Butes, and then we're going to zero in on Izar. And then we're going to zoom in. And, and what do we see here? We see Wolf's uh, image that he took, I believe, uh, last, last week mm -hmm. of uh, Izar. So there you have it. Correct, yeah. And, so this looks a lot like what we just saw on the live view that I showed, except here, you know, the light was collected over a little bit of time. It was averaged to give us kind of a smoother view than the jumpy thing that we saw just now real time, yeah. you know, as it was being uh, disturbed by the atmosphere. So, yeah. Okay, are we ready for the next object? Okay, so yeah, so, so we just talked about this double star and we said our own sun, you know, is a single, but so all these stars had to come from somewhere, right? And, and well, where are they coming from? And they're coming from places we call stellar nurseries. And another name for that is a star forming nebula. A nebula is basically any fuzzy thing in space. So when astronomers first looked at the skies, like, hey, there's a fuzzy and there's a fuzzy, they call them all nebulae. So, but they're different kinds of nebula. Uh, and so one nebula we'll visit here is a star forming nebula. Um, and it's a big cloud of gas, maybe some dust. Here's another thing, astronomy is really easy. Things are either gas or dust when we look out into space. So dust <laughs> is basically stuff we can't see through. And yeah, so you have hydrogen gas in space. You know, hydrogen gas may be compressed, it may collect into balls. If you have enough of that together, gravity will keep crushing it together. Eventually a star will ignite. And then, yeah, and then you're forming stars in, in a nebula, in a gas cloud. And so here, um, we're going to visit one of these nebulae that is called the Eagle Nebula. And it has in it this structure that's very famous called the, the Pillars of Creation. Um, and yeah, this one is kind of hard to see um, with a, a, you know, a small telescope, but certainly if you have, as it says here, a 10 inch telescope, um, you can get a pretty nice view of it in, a, uh, uh, in a good conditions. And uh, yeah, so let's take a, let's, let's visit this guy. Okay. So first we'll orient on the constellation serpents and then we'll shift a little bit to where m16 the eagle nebula is and then this happens to be uh, an image i took of uh, m16 and uh, it's um, too low on the horizon and kind of clouded out at the moment so we're showing an uh, image that uh, we took previously and uh, on this slide here, we're showing, you know, there's the, the latest uh, Hubble pillar, Pillars of Creation shot. Uh, so you can get oriented against uh, my version there. So 
Yeah, so this is a 12 inch telescope that I that I took this with from my home here in the East Bay. And this is what's called a, a false color image. It's a monochrome camera. And then we have uh, three different filters that we assign the colors red, blue, and green. And they actually represent uh, energy coming from uh, hydrogen alpha and doubly ioni ioni or singly ionized sulfur and doubly ionized oxygen. So we say S2 and O3. Uh, those are the, the narrow band filters. And then we assign them to red, green, and blue when we process the image to create this uh, false color image that helps the scientists see the different structures made by the different uh, gases and the energies coming off of those gas and, and dust. Anything you need to correct me on there, Wolf? <laughs> oh, no, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that made sense, right? So I think one key yeah. thing that, that Glenn was just saying is that, yeah, so we actually take images in different ways. There's not just a single way, you know, to look at the night sky with our instruments, but we will look at different wavelengths, you know, different types of light, and that reveals different things. This picture that you're seeing here is optimized to show these beautiful pillars of creation. It actually doesn't show the stars all that much, but there are actually about 8,000 young stars in this nebula. And uh, the young stars that are already burning, they're pretty much outside these pillars that you're seeing. And inside the pillars, we've detected evidence of, of stars that are about to be born, right? So inside those pillars, you know, new stars are forming and they will be igniting at some point, you know, in the future. And, and this, these, these tremendous structures that you're seeing in the pillars of creation, they are shaped by the stars that are outside the pillars, the radiation of those stars is, is, is dispersing and shaping the gas and the dust that's there. So over time, you know, actually the gas and dust will completely disperse. It'll, it'll just kind of uh, be blown off into space, maybe go on to form other stars elsewhere in the future. Uh, but for now, you know, we get to see this amazing image and it is really a spectacular thing. And then one okay. thing to add here uh, very quickly, and, and what Glenn alluded to was the use of different filters, right? Mm -hmm. So that also alludes to the, the idea of different types of astrophotography from one shot, right, with, with a color camera to taking different, uh, different uh, images with different filters on and uh, applying a false color to them and then stacking those and bringing you the image that you're seeing right now. So the different yes. forms of, of astrophotography. Uh, and then, you know, you can pick and choose what form that you want to go with and which one you want to try out. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So that is why I said earlier, you know, the, 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 the imaging telescope I showed you for the double star is a pretty dinky setup compared to what Glenn is using, for example. My thing was just a, a full color camera, right? That was just taking basically single shots, whereas with much more complex equipment and processing, yeah, we can get these kinds of beautiful images of the pillars of creation. Sure, and as Rashi, or I think Conch mentioned earlier, you know, SJA has a couple different imaging programs to, to help people in that side of the, the hobby. So that's also available. So let's zoom on out, get reoriented oriented on uh, Polaris here for our next object. Exactly. So, and as we're getting ready to do that, right? So like we just said, the pillars of creation is a star forming region and the radiation from the young stars actually shapes and blows away this gas cloud. We think that the pillars of creation may hang around for like another hundred thousand years or so. And after that's gone, after that's over, right? Yeah, the gas will have dispersed and what will be left is what we call uh, an open cluster. So star forming regions will ultimately turn into structures called open clusters. Open clusters are collections of stars that were born together, they're siblings of sorts, and they're kind of loosely bound. And usually it's on the order of several hundred thousands, or excuse me, several thousand stars, not hundred thousand, just thousands of stars. Uh, and yeah, they'll drift apart over time, maybe over the course of, you know, hundreds of millions of years, just like families sometimes drift apart, you know, these stars will drift apart. And so we'll have one example here that we call uh, M11, the wild duck cluster. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so we'll have, uh, we'll zoom in on that in a second. And so you can see here on the slide, right? Yeah, there's a single bright red star near the apex of something we call the fan in this structure. Um, and you can actually see M11, yeah, without any uh, equipment, right? Some of these structures you can see with the naked eye or you could use binoculars to see them. And it's actually a lot of fun. If you go out at night in a dark area, there's a lot of stuff you can see with the naked eye. It may take a little bit of practice, but you'd be amazed what you can actually make out. Um, so yeah, maybe we can go ahead and uh, Okay, oh, and I just, if somebody noticed this moving thing here, that's a satellite. So just in <laughs> case you wondered what that was. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, these planetarium maps are able to also simulate satellites and show you where their where their positions happen to be. So if you go and take a look out in the in the real night sky, uh, you'll find them in that same spot. And one one call out as Glenn is moving things around is you you are watching a planetarium app in motion. So there's a lot of rectangles and squares that you get to see. Those are actually images uh, within the planetarium app, and you're not going to see the night sky exactly like that. Just a quick call out. Yeah, so here's uh, an image that I took of M11, and um, I can uh, got to bounce some some screens around here. Uh, but let me. Uh, I did get uh, clouded out a little earlier, so I'm not actually running right at the moment. Uh, let's take a quick look. Uh, this is what my sky looks like from uh, the roof of my house. And so this target that we're looking at is somewhere over in here. So it's sort of semi cloudy at the moment. But uh, as we were starting the program, uh, I was actually imaging M11 and you can see the last, uh, what we call a sub exposure. Again, it's a monochrome camera. And over here, this was taken through a red filter, but it's, you know, it's gonna show black and white because it's a monochrome camera. Uh, so that's the last image that was taken earlier tonight before the clouds drifted through. And But over here, I can take, sort of in semi-real time, take these red, green, and blue filter monochrome images as they come off the camera and stack them. We call it live stacking in this case uh, to create this color image here of, of M11. So almost almost live between the clouds from earlier tonight. <laughs> That's an image of, uh, of M11. Anything else you want to say about M11? Well, it still looks like, a, looks like salt and pepper to me. OK, salt and pepper is another name for it, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know that I've been able to identify which is the, the red, unless it's you know maybe this one here that's the red star that they're referring to. but. Mm. But, but I think one key takeaway is you can look at this image, right? And you do see uh, some color differences, yep. right? This, you yep. know, since, since you said you, you took RGB images and you've combined them, right? right. The, the color pops out somewhat. And so, yeah, you, can doing, you could be doing basically naked eye science here, right? Because the uh, bluer stars are hotter and the yellower yeah. stars are cooler, relatively speaking. And this, this image on the slide up here is color corrected uh, so that it, it's exactly correct in terms of the stars are those exact colors. Uh, so that's, that's the colors of the stars. They're blue and orange and, and white, yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, so this uh, open cluster then, the sibling of, uh, set of sibling stars, right? That over time will drift apart and uh, you know, eventually they'll, they'll go their separate ways. And our sun was born also in a stellar nursery, like we said earlier. At one point, our sun was part of an open cluster. The open cluster that we were a part of has since spread apart, right? Uh, and so now here in our world, right, you know, we see the sun rise and set every day very nicely. Our sun's been around for about four and a half billion years. And you know, our sun will hang around for another four and a half billion years or so. But eventually our sun will run out of fuel and all stars will do this. And when our sun runs out of fuel or other stars like run out of fuel, they turn into something that's called a planetary nebula. And that's a terrible name. I think what happened here is that early astronomers looked at the sky and they say, hey, there's a fuzzy thing. It's a nebula, great. And look, it's a blob, it's not just a dot. So it's, it's got size kind of like a planet when we look through the telescope. So let's call it a planetary nebula. And I think they had no idea what it really was. Since then we figured this out, but the name stuck. Um, so it turns out that a planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets. It's actually a remnant of a star. Our sun will create something like that eventually. Uh, I kind of think of it as a, as a candy with kind of a squishy outer layer, right? And, and a hard, crunchy center. Because what's happened is that the sun has, as it's aged and run out of fuel, it's blown off a bunch of material into space and created a big bubble around itself. And at the center is left over what we call a white dwarf. And the white dwarf is, yeah, it, it's the remnant of the star, which is now inert, but still really, really hot and radiating heat and energy off into space. And as it's radiating that energy off into space, it's causing that bubble it blew off earlier to glow. And so that's, that's the nebula that we see. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so these are kind of fun objects. Here's one that uh, we talked about earlier. And uh, 
Uh, Carl even gave you a demo with this dumbbell there, right? This is uh, something we call the dumbbell nebula because it kind of looks like that. It's also called the apple core nebula sometimes. And uh, um, uh, yeah, so with larger telescopes, right? I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me. So regarding the apple core, so for the folks of you uh, that have a Mac at home, uh, if you bite the apple from both sides, primarily that's what the apple <laughs> would look like. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Thanks, Rashi. So yeah, that's why we call it the apple core, right? Um, and uh, and these, these, these nebulae are actually really, really big, right? So the bubble that's, that's formed is huge. So you can see here in the notes, right, that in this particular case, the bubble that got formed is about three light years in diameter, right? In comparison, our whole solar system is only, I think, about 14 light hours across, right? So it takes about 14 hours for light to go across our solar system. This bubble is big enough, right, that light needs three light years to get from one end to the other. So yeah, let's take a look at this one. So I like planetary nebula. I think they're kind of fun objects. Uh, it, it's interesting to look at these things in the night sky and you know, we can see stars in the different phases of their lives, right? And that teaches us a lot about what's going on out there, teaches us about our past and, and our future here as well. And a quick reminder for the folks that this happens to be within the confines of the summer triangle that we looked at earlier on. Right. Uh, this is right between Velpecula and Sagitta, Velpecula the fox and Sagitta the arrow. Okay, so uh, we, Francesco, do you wanna say something about your image here that we're showing? Yeah, so this image is, a, is a kind of misleading for the observer because uh, if you expect to see this, by looking through a telescope, you're gonna be disappointed for two reasons. First of all, this is a long exposure image. It's the result of four hours of exposures from a, a red zone, so from Mountain View. But the second reason is that uh, the colors, the colors that you see in this image uh, give, a, give you hints about the chemical elements that are in the different parts of the nebula. You see the red parts, that's probably where hydrogen gas is being ionized by the radiation from the star. And the, the general blue-green fuzz in the middle, that's probably oxygen <coughs> doubly ionized, giving off uh, some uh, light uh, in their, their typical teal color. And we don't see colors with, your, with our eyes through a telescope. At night, uh, our eyes uh, are almost insensitive to colors. We can only see color when the objects are very bright like in the case of stars that have a sufficiently, are sufficiently bright to give us the impression of color. And uh, so we can see them, see for instance, Alberio being uh, yellow and blue or uh, Izar being uh, gold and white. But this, uh, this kind of object, you can only see the color in long exposure like this one. Francesca, quick question for you. Uh, if I stare at this for four hours with my eyes behind the binocular, will I see these colors? No, unfortunately you would not because uh, you can stare for all the time that you want, but our brain, uh, the attention span, if you want, is very short. The integration time of our eyes is way less than a second. So if you take uh, your camera and take uh, maybe a one-tenth of a second exposure, the camera will record something similar to what you see with your, uh, with your eyes. But the a long exposure, of course, can go much deeper and can see the colors. Yeah, yeah so that's a really good point that Francesco brought up, right? So we're showing you a whole bunch of pictures that look really cool with lots of fun colors. And yeah, we don't really see those colors when we look through our ground-based telescopes just with our eyes. Um, but, but I really think of these two things as kind of complementary, right? On one hand, I, I keep in my mind, you know, these beautiful color images we see, you know, through imaging techniques. And, and then on the other end, yeah, I'm looking through the telescope with my own eyes and it's a very visceral experience, right? And I see the object directly, you know, those photons, those light particles that have been traveling for hundreds, thousands, millions of years, you know, are hitting my eye. And, you know, I, I can, then look at both of these things, right? The live view through the telescope and my imagine my uh, these color pictures in my mind, right? And kind of combine them, uh, and it, it's a pretty cool experience. And and for the Dumbbell Nebula here, you do get actually a very crisp, clear image on a dark night, you know, through a, a, one of our uh, amateur telescopes. 
Okay, and I think we wanted to check in with Bruce and yeah. see if he's uh, able to see the dumbbell nebula between the, the clouds now or... Bruce, are you there? Go ahead and start sharing. Hi. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Yep. Um, let's see here. I have a few screens to share and uh, should have tried this earlier. Um, that's okay. You can select your uh, your desktop when you do the screen share. Uh, my entire desktop. Yeah. Desktop. Okay. That's, that's Got make it. it easier. Yep. Yep. Ah, huh. gonna take me a second. So, so maybe while he's doing that, I guess, right? So, so I don't know if you guys can uh, all see the dumbbell or the apple core, right? The uh, the the image that's still showing the the bites out of the apple are basically at the top and at the bottom. Yes, Bruce. I, un unfortunately, I'm, I'm uh, because of permissions, I'm going to have to quit Zoom and get back in in order to share my screen. So, I'm going. I'll be back in a minute. Please uh, take care of things while I'm gone. All right. No worries. Yeah, no worries. So, Wolf, you were talking about the apple core. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, because, you know, we've called it the dumbbell nebula or the apple core nebula. And maybe not everybody can actually see where the dumbbell or the apple core really is, right? Because you're not used to the image. Uh, and sometimes seeing these shapes, you know, that, that we used to describe it, they do take some imagination. You know, I've, I've stared at some of these things going, I don't see it. And then somebody says, oh, look at it this way. And it's like, oh, there it is. And then you can't unsee it after that. So here, yeah, so the apple core is essentially, uh, or the apple has been taken um, from the top and from the bottom and right, that's where the bites have happened. So the, the red parts, right, are essentially the remaining apple, uh, the peel of the apple, right, if you will, so. Um, yeah, and I can, I can help out. Let me quickly share my screen, um, give it one second and I can maybe draw that out for you um, to, to help the folks out. So let's see if we can do this while we wait for Bruce to come back in. All right, so I'll get so the- Here, uh, now it's turned a little bit, right? So this image is turned from the one we just saw. That is correct. Yep. So let's go ahead and draw this out. So you're looking at the core like that, bitten from two sides. Did I get that right? Yeah, exactly. So here, the left and the right are then more diffuse, right, from our perspective. I mean, there's still stuff there, but uh, it gets fainter, right? So the, the nebula is more diffuse to the, you know, like lower, lower left and top right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these things come in different shapes. Uh, so there's another famous planetary nebula also in the summer triangle called the Ring Nebula. Uh, we'll probably end up showing that at some point later this summer. And uh, that one looks like a smoke ring in space, or Rashi and I sometimes call it a space donut or something. You know? So uh, we always end up getting hungry when we look at those objects. And here you go. For whomever that wants to do some weightlifting, we've got the dumbbell right the there. Dumbbell, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. Maybe one other thing to uh, talk about while we're waiting for uh, Bruce to come back. It's like, you know, so. So these nebulae, right, they, they are actually super diffuse. Uh, they're, they're less dense than some of the best vacuums on Earth. Uh, you know, when you look at science fiction movies and there's a spaceship that's flying through a nebula, it's always like this really dense fog, you know, and rocks flying around. It's nothing like that when we talk about these actual nebulae, right? Uh, I remember there was a star at the center that's poofed off its outer layer and that bubble has gotten huge, you know, many light years across. So the material there is very diffuse. It's, it's uh, thinner than than the best vacuums on Earth. All right, Bruce is back. All right, excellent. Okay, so I'm uh, sorry about that, everybody. Um, well, like Glenn, I've been having a lot of clouds come through tonight. And, and uh, at the moment, uh, there's a clear spot right around the Dumbbell Nebula. This is the Dumbbell Nebula in there. Up oh, there's another cloud. <laughs> um, so because of the clouds, I'm not going to be able to demonstrate an actual live stack at the moment. But what I can do is I can simulate what it's like to stack images um, similar to the way that Glenn was doing it. Uh, I'm gonna do it with the Dumbbell Nebula with some 
data that I have from uh, uh, another night in a darker spot. So it'll actually be an improvement over what I would be able to get uh, tonight in any case. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, from up in the Sierras a couple of years ago. I uh, dug up the data just in case because I knew it was going to maybe be cloudy tonight. And uh, I'm going to uh, basically have this software called SharpCap um, watch uh, all the files that are in a folder and take each one of them and stack them on top of each other. Um, it's a little more than, I think it's about an hour and a half worth of data total. Most of them are 30 second images taken with a one shot color camera um, through a very similar telescope. It's a refractor, uh, the same camera that's on my telescope tonight. And uh, let's just get it started. And it won't take long for it to uh, develop an image. So there's the Dumbbell Nebula in the middle there. And as you can see, it starts out very grainy and uh, not too detailed. And the signal to noise ratio is pretty low. Uh, each image that it puts on top of the, neck, the, the prior images uh, adds more detail, takes away noise, uh, and basically uh, develops the image into a much better quality image. Uh, you do eventually get to a point of diminishing returns and, and you don't see much uh, improvement after uh, a while, but these are pretty short exposures. So um, probably up until at least 100 of them, you're gonna see improvements, if not more. I see I have 276 of these. So far it has stacked 10% of that. Um, as you can see down here, it's saying how many frames it has stacked. Um, you can zoom out a little bit so you can get a little better picture of the entire field of view. Um, so it's quite cropped when I zoom in like that. Uh, but it's pretty amazing um, the uh, capability that we have with software these days to be able to uh, live stack or do traditional imaging um, using Stellarium and other software, uh, the SkyX or SharpCap. Um, anyway, that's about 50 of them. Um, you guys are seeing this, right? Yeah, it's very cool. Okay, cool. Uh, you can make adjustments to it. I, I actually ran this last night just to test it out and I made some adjustments to the histogram. So you can, uh, this entire graph here is, is all the data that is in each of the images and it's the stacked averaged data also. Um, and uh, basically, uh, to simplify it, it's uh, this is basically mostly a pollution uh, to darken up the image. And uh, you drag the side in to brighten it up a little bit in the midtones. And uh, it's kind of like developing. Um, anyway, that's basically what I have to show you with the Dumbbell Nebula. Yeah, very cool. So keep in mind all right so at the center of this bubble that you're seeing there is what we call the white dwarf star right which is the remnant of that star that previously ran out of fuel and blew off its outer layers and that remnant is mostly carbon and oxygen you can kind of think of them maybe as like giant space diamonds even if you will so that's what our sun will do right uh, but there are stars that are actually much larger than our sun and what will they do well it turns out if a star gets big enough then uh, it does not turn into a planetary nebula it will end its life in a different way the planetary nebula is kind of a gentle poof in a way, right? Things just kind of gently get blown out. The larger stars, they kind of have a big kablooey, right? They actually blow up in what we call a supernova explosion. And, uh, and supernova explosions are uh, very energetic events. Uh, in history, you know, people have seen them with their naked eyes. We have not seen one recently nearby, but we will at some point in the future. Um, 
uh, there's a star in the winter sky called Betelgeuse. That guy is going to go supernova at some point in the not too distant future. And who knows, maybe it'll happen in my lifetime and then I'll be able to see that and that would be great. And, Be uh, and, and uh, Betelgeuse and stars like it, when they supernova, they actually generate a lot of the material that you and I are all made of. So we could have lots more discussion about that. And if you like, I'll tell you more about that next Friday. But yeah, supernova explosions, very energetic, make a lot of the materials that planets and people are made of. Uh, and uh, they're just also really beautiful objects. So we'll visit one of these right now, which is in Cygnus. Um, and uh, yeah, Rashi mentioned it earlier. It's in the Summer Triangle. And, uh, and yeah, the, uh, the, the right, uh, the wing of the swan, Cygnus the swan. Uh, and then that's where we'll see the Veil Nebula. Yeah. yeah, actually, I'm sorry. It's not literally in the Summer Triangle. Thank you for the correction, right? It's actually adjacent to it, right? It's a little bit outside. Uh, and in this particular case, yeah, you know, we see the remnant of a star that was 20 times more massive than, than our sun. And, uh, and yeah, it's blown up about 10 to 20,000 years ago. And in that time, it's made a huge, huge bubble. We just said that the bubble from the planetary nebula was maybe one to three light years across, depending on the nebula. Here, we're talking about tens of light years across. So these bubbles are enormous in size. So uh, yeah, let's go visit this guy. Okay, so we'll get oriented on Cygnus. And then we'll rotate a little bit to the Veil Nebula and zoom in. And you see here uh, pictures going by of other areas of the Veil Nebula. But this one's called the Western Veil. And I think, uh, Nicola, how is your cloud situation? Uh, well, I was able to take one image, one single image before the clouds came. And I'm going to share with you. OK. Uh, OK. Yes. You have to stop your screen. Yeah, just you, you go ahead and share, and it'll grab okay. it. OK. All right, so right now I'm connected to my uh, telescope rig through uh, Wi-Fi. And uh, what we can see here is right before the clouds came, there was a short section of the sky where the nebula was there. And I was able to take one image, um, one single frame image, 160 seconds. You can see actually how stretches the nebula. Uh, right now the image is black and white because uh, the CCD camera is monochrome. Uh, the filter in the camera is uh, hydrogen alpha. So hydrogen alpha is uh, a specific band of um, uh, wave length of light, um, which is typical for the W ionized hydrogen. And the telescope cannot see any other light except, uh, let's say, this specific wavelength. And that's why actually the telescope is able to see, to capture this nebula image uh, out of uh, the city city sky. So it is black and white. If we want to make it colorful, we need to do a live stack. Um, right now, because it's cloudy, it's not possible to be done. But to make it colorful, we need uh, three other, two other filters, which are oxygen-3 and um, sulfur-2. So when all these uh, three filters are combined and we use software to stack all the frames, then we get what actually Bruce was showing. Uh, and it will come like a as a colorful image. So as um, Wolf mentioned, actually this is this nebula is a remnant from uh, supernova. Um, and uh, actually I want to show you today a real supernova, which actually exploded this week. Um, and um, because it's cloudy, we have a cloudy sky, I had to actually um, use a robotic telescope from New Mexico. Uh, this, the telescopes are available online. And uh, they can be used by any anybody. Basically, it's the easiest way to get an image uh, from remote base uh, telescopes from your chair. You don't need to go to New Mexico at all, right? But what I'm showing you right now on the image is uh, a supernova. If you see where my mouse is, um, I'm pointing with with the cursor of the mouse. This is a real supernova in a galaxy called M85. So the galaxy is actually 60 million light years away. And this supernova came uh, this week. Um, it's actually a big news into the professional astronomers 
uh, they are taking data right now. Um, the supernova is uh, supernova type 1A. So the supernova type 1A is actually a combination of two stars. Uh, one is a red giant star. It's a very massive star, um, 100 times heavier than the sun. And um, the next star, the, the component star, is actually a white dwarf star, which is actually a star which is a few kilometers uh, big, actually, with a high density. So when these two star, stars actually collapse, they merge together, they form a supernova called supernova type 1A. So why astronomers are so interested in these stars is because when they uh, this supernova actually explodes, they get a flash. And this flash is a significant, uh, uh, a very distinguished peak in the flux of the energy. And by measuring that, they actually can uh, measure the distance to the galaxy. So it's called redshift. Um, and by the redshift, uh, Edwin Hubble actually he actually confirmed that actually the universe is expanding, right? So these supernova type one are used for that to actually confirm whether the universe, universe is expanding and how fast it's expanding. And basically this is like a, a standard measure of whether the laws of the physics are still valid, right? Um, so yeah, so what you're seeing right now is a supernova um, right now, um, in a week, week and a half, it will be gone. So right now, um, it's a unique, unique time to see it. Um, and yeah, I can give the ball back to Bruce. Yeah. So Nicholas, quick, Nicholas, uh, quick point. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry. Ahead, uh, quick point over there. Uh, maybe you guys already mentioned that uh, the supernova is an exploding uh, star. Uh, yeah. if, if that was not mentioned before. Go ahead, please. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna ask, so if someone wanted to see it from our location in the Bay Area, how would one see this? So um, so to see this star, uh, this supernova, we need a um, uh, telescope similar to uh, one of ours. Um, mm -hmm. Usually for supernova, we need a big, a big telescope with a big aperture, pretty much similar to the one that uh, Glenn has, uh, because we need the uh, resolution. And um, astronomers, professional astronomers, they usually take not that long exposures to see the supernova because if you take very long exposure, the supernova will be just washed out into the into the galaxy. Um, so they take usually about 100 seconds um, of exposition time because some, sometimes supernova very, could be very close to the core of the galaxy and uh, very high exposition time will just wax the supernova. Um, so we need an imaging rig. So we need a similar, similar to what we have to see it. It cannot be seen with naked eye, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, unless we, uh, I, I may take a shot at it here in a few minutes, depending on how much time we have. And it, it might be behind the house or behind a cloud, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Yeah. So Nicola, how, how long do these things uh, usually last? So usually they um, depends. That's where it's sometimes they can have a second peak. Um, and if they second, have a second peak, usually it takes a couple of more weeks. But right now we just uh, we have to watch and uh, measure, right? Um, we are what we know now right now is that we are still into the first peak of the supernova, which means the supernova brightness is going to increase more in the next few days, um, and then it will start declining quickly. Whether it's going to have a second peak next week, we don't know yet. We, we have yet to see that. Okay, amazing. We are we are witnessing the death of a star live. Yes, and that one star in that galaxy is almost outshining the whole galaxy in, in this supernova phase. I, I find that pretty pretty interesting that you can yeah. pick out and one then, star in that galaxy. Yeah, and, and maybe all I should. That material and all that material is going to be what's going to cause the birth of new stars. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the, the iron of, in our uh, bodies came from this supernova. So. Yeah, all the heavy elements that we have. Um, yeah. So I may have mentioned correct that we are seeing the live on death of the star, but which happened probably 60 million light years of, uh, uh, 60 million years ago, right? That's what you said. Yeah. It's a 60 million years ago. So yeah. actually, dead long time back. Yeah, back to dinosaurs. Yeah, so. <laughs> 
Okay, back to Wolf, I think. Uh, is he muted or? We may have lost Wolf. Yes, we have. All right, okay. well, I, so I that... can soldier on here. Okay. Uh, so the next object we wanted to talk about was uh, a globular cluster. And uh, those are objects that actually are part of, of our galaxy, or at least our companions to the, to the Milky Way. And they're tight, uh, uh, perhaps primitive galaxies, small galaxies that orbit up and down through the, the plane of, uh, of, the, of our galaxy. And they're pretty fascinating to, to look at. And I just clicked on the wrong thing. Let me figure out how to correct that. Sorry no about so that. Not, when we're talking about globular clusters, I mean, these are ancient structures. Like Glenn said, you know, they're probably cores of smaller galaxies where the rest of the galaxies are even consumed by ours. Uh, but these cores are left behind and they are they're orbiting our our galactic core, right? Our galaxy, about 150 of those have been found to date. And they're very dense structures with hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars. And we're going to be looking at M92. And I know Carl called out earlier on, M92 is roughly around somewhere close to, or estimated to be somewhere close to 330,000 stars. So we, we showed, uh, you know, what in the movie Star Wars, what a uh, couple stars would look like. Uh, can you imagine if you had uh, hundreds of thousands of, of stars that were so close that they were visible during the, during the day? In fact, you probably wouldn't have any night at all uh, yeah. if you were inside a, a globular cluster. Um, so we have a couple notes on, on this globular cluster is, is nearby uh, one that's a little more famous, M13. And so they're suggesting here that that uh, the seasoned uh, uh, astronomers will will play jokes on on the newbies and try to get them to to find uh, M M92 and they'll misidentify it as M13 or vice versa or something. So anyway, uh, that's a fun thing to do at a star party, I guess. And uh, yeah, let's and, go. And, and and M13, we'll, we'll take a look at it next time, but M13 yeah. has supposedly a lot more stars than M92. I All right, so that. let's get uh, oriented. Starting from Polaris, we're gonna go to the uh, constellation of Hercules, and then we'll shift a little bit to the left there and get centered on M92, and we'll zoom in. And that is what a globular cluster looks like. So imagine that you were on a planet somewhere in the center of that thing. That would be a, a pretty uh, interesting sky to, to have. And I really love the colors in this one. And again, the colors are, have been corrected to be the true colors of the, of the stars. Yeah. Um, so this, this is an image uh, that I have taken of uh, M92 uh, about a month ago. And you see the colors are a little more accurate here in the, in the slide version. Um, yeah, so we, we said that's a distance of about uh, 26 light years. Again, these things kind of orbit up and down through the, through the galaxy. So that's a lot closer than other galaxies. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and see what's going on with the with the telescope for this one. So let me hide this window. So you can see in the lower left here that um, uh, we're clouded out at the moment again. But uh, again, while we were dealing with uh, uh, Bruce's stuff, uh, I was able to to catch one <laughs> image again. Uh, so that's this. Here, a monochrome image, and then uh, by through the magic of live stacking, which Bruce did a great job of explaining, uh, you know, data that I took last night and uh, in between the clouds here tonight. This is a, a live uh, color view of uh, of M92 uh, globular cluster. So there you have it. I think these are really beautiful objects. These are some of my favorite things to look at through uh, my telescope at night. So, you know, I hope you can uh, you can all come visit us one of these days when we're out in the field and you can see one of these yourselves. So, and yeah, like like you guys said, I think while um, I had uh, accidentally dropped off the internet here, 
that, uh, uh, yeah, these are companions to the Milky Way galaxy, right? So, so these globular clusters orbit around and through our galaxy. And then the final thing we'll visit tonight is other galaxies, right? So pretty much everything we've talked about so far has been in our own galaxy or, or just around it. Um, but now it's time to actually go ahead and visit uh, another galaxy. And the galaxy is on the order of hundreds of billions of stars. Our nearest neighbor is about two and a half million light years away. Uh, many other ones we see on the order of tens of millions of light years. And uh, yeah, the one we'll visit tonight is M106, which is a nice spiral galaxy. The Milky Way is also a spiral. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, let's go check it out. Okay. So M106. This was right between the Ursa Major, the Pan, and Canis Venatici. Yes. So there's Canis Venatici, and then we're focusing on M106. And again, this is a, an image that I took uh, earlier in the year uh, from the East Bay here, uh, despite the, the light pollution. One point six million light years away. Again, galaxies being very far away from our galaxy. And Bruce, are you there? What's going on I, with M one oh six? I am here. Um, here, let me uh, share my screen again. Okay. And I think Bruce, you also said that your M twenty seven stack is much improved. Yes, my M27 stack has kind of come back, uh, you know, come into its own here, uh, oh, developed wow. quite nicely. Um, so that was after about an hour and a half of integration, uh, mostly 30 second exposures. It's 276 frames. Um, okay, so M106. I currently have clouds in front of M106, as you can see here. But um, looks like you are in the inside M906. Looks like <laughs> the stars there. <laughs> this is uh, this is where M106 is, actually. Uh, I guess it has a different name in the uh, NGC 4258. Um, and I also have a live stack of M106 in a similar way to the live stack that I did with M27, although these were done with um, 220 second exposures and there are only 39 of them. So this should come together pretty quickly. And also, you know, once again, demonstrate how you can start out with a very grainy subframe and as it adds more and more of these together, you get less grain, more detail, more signal, and uh, I'm just going to drop this part out of the way. Oh, and by the way, there are some other nice galaxies right around M106. Um, the, I don't know the names off the top of my head, um, but it's, it's basically in a uh, very nice area of the sky that has lots of galaxies. If you go deep, you can see many, many little teeny galaxies. Um, so let's see here. That's 20 out of 39 stacks, actually 26, 27. Zoom in a little bit. So we are probably seeing uh, how many stars are in uh, M106? Billions. Yeah, galaxies um, are usually on the order of, you know, a few hundred billion to a trillion stars. And I think we typoed something earlier. This thing is actually about 24 million light years away. So, uh, uh, you know, this, this thing is out there. So we are looking back in time, 24 million years. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it took that long for the light from that galaxy to get here, right? So this is one of the kind of amazing things when you look at this yourself through a telescope, right? That that photon, that light particle that hits your eye had been traveling for about 24 million years be before it hits your eye. It's mind blowing. Yes, every, every time you look at the night sky, you're looking into the past. Telescopes are time machines. Indeed. 
I mean, even the moon, right? It's, it's uh, what, uh, we'll keep me honest here. I think it's like uh, 1.3 seconds mm -hmm. for the yeah, light uh, from light. the moon, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then about uh, eight and a half minutes uh, from the sun to us. Yep. So, yeah. So I, I did just manage to catch uh, the supernova uh, here live. If you want to see that quickly, I can show that. All right, we are kind of a, a little uh, short of time, but we should go there and take a look quickly. And uh, Joy is still waiting. Uh, folks, uh, okay. wait around a bit. Just real quick. Joy is waiting to expose his surprise. So this is just at the corner of my my house right now. So the, this fuzzy stuff is because it's it's partly the roof is partly covering it, but that's it right there. Um, this is M85, the galaxy, and that to the left of this star here is the the supernova. So that was taken just a while we were while Bruce was talking, basically. So very cool. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. All right. Um, let me get back on the script here. So if we're done with M106, yeah, so actually that's the, the end of the armchair observing section, except for the surprise. So whoever wants to take yeah. it away from me. All right, so let me uh, share the screen. You can say goodbye to RCDO here. Ah, uh, yes, the gift wrap. Uh, yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, well, I uh, hope you enjoyed that section. So this is uh, it's time to uh, to go to Joe, who's been patiently waiting in an undisclosed location. So, Joe, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Hello. All right. Hi, everyone. All right. Um, are you guys able to see my camera? Looks okay. Um, yeah, we're, yes, we'll, put, we'll put a spotlight on you. Conch, you want to stop sharing? Sure. Yeah. Let's see here. Right. Okay, well, hi everyone. Um, my name is Joe. Uh, as you can see, I'm outside uh, with, a, with a red head headlamp and with some luck today, hopefully we'll get to look at some objects live in real time. Uh, first I'll say uh, um, I have a red headlamp, not because red's my favorite color. Um, it turns out the color red is actually less sensitive to the eyes and it helps to protect your night vision. So it allows you to see well uh, in the dark and still have a little bit of light so you can uh, maneuver around and interact with your equipment. So I'm going to show you something really cool today that will uh, bring the majesty of the night sky back to our uh, light polluted suburbs. You know, I'm here in San Jose uh, in, in the backyard, and it's and it's really quite bright because there's uh, city lights, uh, you know, street lights all around. Uh, there's kind of like an orange glow to the sky, um, and if I kind of just turn the camera around. Um, uh, unfortunately, you can't really see much right now. Like this is just with you know the back of my iPhone uh, camera. Uh, you can see it's, it's very dark here, um, and and when I look up, I can see a an orange glow. Um, and I and I think uh, you know growing up, that was kind of always the experience I always had. Uh, but about 13 years ago, I was uh, with a group of friends, and we went out to Yosemite National Park. And on the way back, I suggested to the driver, like, hey, I think we should, um, you know, like stop by the side of the road. And it was like dark, 9, 9.30 p.m. then. And we should kind of take a look at this, take a look at the stars. And there was another car, car in front of us. And uh, they, you know, we were going together as two cars. And so we pulled over to the side of the road and then the other car stopped over and they thought we had run into some car trouble. Like, you know, it was our tire uh, flat or something. And and, and then we said, no, we took, I, we told them to look up and they looked up and the whole sky was just like filled with stars from one end to the other. And there was this Milky Way that was going from one end of the horizon to the other. And it was, and everybody was just breathtaking. It was like, wow, like something had like, um, like my eyes had been opened to this whole new universe. And uh, ever since then, I've just really wanted to kind of recapture that experience. And it's very difficult uh, to get, get out to a dark sky. Uh, it takes, a, you have to drive out a couple of hours, like Yosemite is a four hour drive. Uh, but today I wanted to show you this uh, technology called uh, a night vision intensifier, which uh, hopefully will bring a little bit of that back um, uh, to, uh, to, to be able to experience it live here in, 
of San Jose. So uh, first I'm going to just flip the camera around. And for this, I'm gonna turn on the white light. It should be a little easier to see. Okay, uh, so what we have here is uh, what looks sort of like a one half of a uh, binocular. Um, you know, some people call it a monocular, but this is actually a, a night vision image intensifier. And what, what this does is the light that comes in here on the front end uh, through the lens uh, gets amplified about 60, 70,000 times. Uh, there's, you know, a photon kind of like strikes something and then it turns into like 60,000 uh, uh, ampl amplification factor. And what that allows uh, you to do is to see a lot of light that would normally be too faint uh, for the eye to see. Uh, there's actually a lot of, like when you're in a completely, what seems like a completely dark closet, there's actually a lot of photons that are actually hitting your eye, but you just, uh, your eye doesn't perceive them because you need a certain minimum amount of photons uh, simultaneously hitting your eye before your brain registers it. Uh, so this amplifies those to the point where your brain is able to register them. And then, uh, and then as you see, I've got my phone uh, connected here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is uh, share my screen from the phone and hopefully we'll be able to see uh, something cool up there. Uh, so let's see here, I'm gonna uh, share screen. I found out Zoom has this way of um, sharing your phone screen, which is actually really cool. So hopefully this will this will do it. Okay. Yep, we can we see. Go. All right. I'm going to switch over to um, this app called Nightcap. And I'm going to set the exposure and zoom in a little bit. And I see stars. And this is a completely live image. Oh, it looks like I'm gonna have to focus a little bit. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna pick up the tripod and look around. So, uh, so are those uh, clouds I, that you're seeing uh, in between the, the yeah, stars? Yeah, okay. I think those are clouds. I mean, there's Milky Way there, um, but it might be a little hard to differentiate what's Milky Way and what's clouds. It's it's actually a unfortunately a rather cloudy day. Um, but as yeah. I pan around, you can see like this is a lot more stars than you could ever see in, in the, the suburbs of San Jose. Um, it's almost like the kind of the experience that you would get from a dark sky like Yosemite. And I can I also show you what it looks like terrestrially. Like you know, if I just point at the ground here, um, you know, earlier I had my, had my phone out and um, you know, I, can, I can show you. Like earlier I had my phone out and you, you saw what was kind of more or less a completely black uh, surroundings, uh, just maybe a couple of lights from the street. But now like with the uh, intensifier, it's actually, oh, it's actually, you can see fairly well. Uh, this is this is a kind of a type of technology that the military use a lot when they're, you know, out, out in the in nighttime situations. Uh, sometimes they use infrared to kind of like um, also as a way to see in the dark, but it works really well uh, in astronomy, really bringing uh, dark skies kind of back to uh, to the suburbs. Now let's see if there's anything here we can we can show you guys. Yeah, we had very good weather here in the Bay Area in the past few days, and we will have very good weather the next few days. Just a little bit unfortunate today we have a cloudy cloudy sky. Yeah. So right in hey, front Joe, of is that is that Jupiter and Saturn over there? Yeah, yeah, that's Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the brighter one is Jupiter, and they're, and this is a, a year known as like the Great Conjunction, and what that means is like every 20 years, Jupiter and Saturn are in the same part of the sky, and I think this December, they'll be like so close that you can see them in uh, the eyepiece of a telescope. They'll be, you know, just like um, maybe like 10 Jupiter widths apart from each other, and so that'll be a real unique event. Let me see if I can, if we have anything here on the other half of the sky. Um, oh yeah, there's the uh, the Big Dipper actually. So let's see if I can uh, put this down. So the, uh, the, the if I can, um, if you guys can kind of see the uh, saucepan of the Big Dipper kind of like right here in the middle. 
um, like these four stars here are the saucepan and then the, the handle of the Big Dipper is, is are these three stars there. Um, and then I'll show you a couple of other things that I'm, that I'm able to do right now. The sky is changing, but I think we might be able to get some nebula over there in the distance. Oh, actually, uh, I think that's Milky Way there. Yeah, like there's a kind of like a dark, a dark lane. Oops, you know, bring down the exposure a little bit. Um, maybe about that much. Yeah, I'm yeah. able to see actually um... a little bit of the Milky Way. It kind of yeah. comes and goes. It's yeah, but dust from the Milky Way is visible a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's like there's dark lanes in the Milky Way, which are sort of caused by uh, dust obscuring the starlight from behind it. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is put on a 3x uh, magnifier, and you can you can know, just show what that looks like. Uh, this guy here, ooh, this probably doesn't come out that well. Is a uh, an attachment that you can put it onto the front of your um, night vision device to magnify the sky 3x. So I want to just do that right now. It should take it should take a minute and I'm gonna I'm gonna put on a filter called a hydrogen alpha filter and that basically uh, cuts away most of the light pollution in the sky and allows the frequency that most emission many emission nebula um, emit at to, uh, to pass through the filter. Okay. okay, putting on the magnifier right now. Okay, and then refocusing. Which object are you trying to point at, Joe, right now? Trying to go for the uh, Triffid and Lagoon Nebula. Those are easiest to show up uh, through the uh, through the filter. Okay, folks. So it's just like the uh, 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 the pillars of creation that we showed before. Something similar. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me try to focus first. Oh, you can actually, if you can actually kind of see it here. Right now, right now I've just got the one X magnifier. So first I'll show it at one X. So those two bright nebula near the top of my screen are the Triffid and the Lagoon. And you can see how big it is because like, you know, this is for example, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. You know, here's the, here's the backyard. And then pointing up right there in the center of the screen. Or the Triffid and the Lagoon. And what I'm gonna also do is do a longer exposure so that um, it'll average out the noise. All right, there that's pretty cool, so, yeah. So yeah, that's the Triffid, that's the Lagoon. Um, let's see if I can get it to show with the three X. The X magnifier. Okay. 
There we go. Looks reasonably focused. Now I'll do, so the lagoon is the one on the bottom and the trifid is the, the one right, right above it. There we go. And you can actually see uh, some like nebulosity around it. Definitely some, that whole area is very rich in emission nebula. Do one more exposure. So, so it's averaging out the noise. Um, and this is really just like about uh, eight seconds. Uh, so you get images really fast. You also get images live as they're building. Um, the one other thing that I think Okay, so see, um, oh, is that good? Okay. Um, well, it's gonna, I gotta, it might be difficult. Yeah, it's not the, the best of the times today. Uh, the clouds, there's too many clouds, but hopefully we could do this again and uh, show the folks uh, more objects. Um, so yeah. Joe, like uh, how much are one of these uh, rigs? Well, they're, they're quite expensive. Uh, like I think the, you probably need at least a thousand to be able to, to get into it. Um, you know, depending on the models and everything. But I think like with all the astrophotography, uh, you know, there's significant investment up front. Um, but yeah. if it's, it's uh, I, you know, I suggest like uh, going to like a star party and if anyone's able to show you one, I could, sh you know, I could give people a glance to see if this is something that they would be interested in. Yeah, but it's so, it's an easier uh, uh, apparatus to carry around and uh, not that many, that much setup compared to an imaging rig. And if you're not into that, this is a, a very interesting uh, setup to, to yeah. see yeah. One of the night sky from the light polluted skies. One of the other interesting things that you can also do with uh, with this such equipment is you can actually piggy this back uh, behind an eyepiece on a telescope. Um, which is which is another way of doing night vision astronomy, uh, and and you can get more magnified views and get closer and see a lot of detail uh, with that kind of setup as well. Yeah, that's true. Like most of the objects that were shown today, like earlier, uh, you can see those uh, with night vision, and you can you can even see uh, a little bit of it, like um, even just like uh, through uh, a big telescope in the light polluted skies. Like I can identify most of the galaxies and. Uh, the globular clusters, uh, nebula, like, uh, and with with night vision, you'll you'll want to use a filter um, to uh, to cut away most of the light pollution, so that it's only either like a long pass filter, which allows just like the near infrared light to come in, or hydrogen alpha filter to to for, uh, specifically just for the nebula. All right. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. This is really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, I think. Uh, All right. Uh, Thank you. Our new, yeah, well, uh, hopefully we can see more of this uh, in the coming events. Um, and our next segment is the Q&A. Uh, Sukada. Sure. 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 That was wonderful, Joe. I mean, I would definitely like to know more about that. Uh, so we have received a few more questions on the chat channel. So I'm just going to relay them to you guys uh, and we can... Uh, answer them for every like we had some discussion about it but i think it would be good to everyone for to hear about some of this stuff so one question was about stellarium app uh people want to know if the if the app owners have an opinion about whether the pro version is worth the extra cost if you don't have a telescope uh drive to program it or whatever so would you would you go purchase a free app or would you actually shell out the money to buy the pro version sounds like a question for glenn well i you know i'm using it on a desktop and i wasn't aware that there was a a pro version so the mm -hmm. the desktop is is free and as far as i knew the the uh, telephone the phone version was free yeah, as I, well. I wonder if we're maybe mixing up uh, like sky, sky safari, safari. No, 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 there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is an answer about, for it so I, I can quickly chime in on that one. Sorry, guys. Sure, uh, sure. So Stellarium for your uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac uh, desktops or laptops is free. Uh, but when it comes to the mobile version, there is a free version, and then there is a paid plus version. Uh, and that paid plus version is about $10, and that just happens to have a larger database 
uh, than the free version uh, on the on the mobile devices. Um, so, okay. Rashi, this is Swami. I have a question for you on that. Uh, the the version that is listed on the app uh, app store or on the Play Store, they are they seem to be made by some other commercial company. So I'm not sh even sure if it is the same as the Stellarium software that we use on the desktop and laptop, or is it an entirely different software which just happens to have the same name? No, there's definitely yeah. the the same program uh, on the on the iPhones, but and Android, but um yeah i don't know the ins and outs of maybe somebody licensed it and is selling it or something okay. yeah that's a very good question i don't have an answer to that one i know that there's a free solarium and a paid solarium which is a plus which is the larger uh, database on the mobile side but for your laptops and desktops from both windows linux uh well actually all three and mac uh then that version happens to be free Okay. And for that, yeah. for, for the databases, you can actually download multiple files uh, to complete uh, your, your database set. Right. Yeah, I have only used the Mac version. So on, on my laptop years ago, before I switched to Sky Safari, so I didn't even know there was a paid version, like Glenn said. Uh, but that's helpful to know. Uh, another question about for imagers about stacking softwares so is there a good tutorial emma is asking if there is a good tutorial for sharp cap stacking and also uh, the other options being registax and auto stacker for uh, Re registax and auto stacker are used mostly for planetary or or solar um, they're a different type of of uh, uh, stacking for for what's called lucky imaging and that's when you're taking a whole bunch of really short exposures and you're trying to conquer the turbulence in the atmosphere by um, you know, taking those really short exposures and then this stacking software will pull out the, both the full frames that are the most in focus or, and even uh, sub areas of a frame that are more uh, in focus uh, as you know, the atmosphere roils around. Um, so those are those, like I said, planetary, solar, uh, the moon, things that are that are super bright. Uh, so the sharp cap uh, for for live stacking uh, is uh, you know is a good program. Uh, it's not going to do it, it can do one shot color, but it can't make color images from. Uh, the monochrome with with filters. There's a free program called Astro Toaster, not to be confused with Astro Tortilla. Uh, that that that. <laughs> now I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, that that uses uh, another program called Deep Sky Stacker, which is free uh, in underneath uh, to do the live stacking, and that's what I was using to take uh, you know the the monochrome filtered files. As they came off the camera and create a, a color image in in real time, um, so that's a that's a free one. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. I, I want to point out that uh, you know for the the folks who have uh, astrophotography questions, you can get more detailed, more technical answers by attending Glenn and Bruce's uh, events for those. Yes, yep. definitely. I was just about to say this sounds like something that. Uh, one of our imaging group folks can write an article about <laughs> the, about stacking softwares and people can learn more about it uh, from their point of view. And one last question I found this, like, I think this would be a very interesting question to discuss uh, uh, for everyone to understand. How come the images you were showing were not shaky from the air molecules? So um, we're we're doing something called auto guiding, which is kind of helps. Uh, that's that's actually kind of a deep, <laughs> oh, okay, a deep question. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's actually a really <laughs> deep question. Um, so th there's a bunch of stuff in astrophotography that you're doing to get the best picture that you can, but it's all based on what you can do given the scene, which is how we describe, put a number on how messed up is the atmosphere at, at any given time. 
Um, and so we, we, we say that typical, typical amateur scene means that a pinpoint star, like Wolf talked about this, right? A, 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 the star should be just a pinpoint of light uh, will actually wiggle around and create a ball that's about two arc seconds uh, across. And then, you know, if you've got 360 degrees in, an, in a, you know, all the way around a circle, then you have uh, 60 arc minutes in a degree and 60 arc seconds uh, in uh, an arc minute. So it, if you, um, I won't go through the whole hand thing with degrees and everything, but if you took the size of a golf ball and you ran out about five kilometers or six kilometers, I'm probably getting it wrong, but anyway, it's way out there. That's what an arc second, you know, looks like on the, on the sky. And so we're trying to track stars with our mounts and our auto guiding and everything to be within, you know, one arc second, given that typical amateur scene is two arc seconds, right? So that's the Nyquist sampling theory, but, um, so I guess that's a okay. short, short answer to it. To a, uh, I, I hope Melanie, Melanie got her answer. <laughs> that yeah. was a question from Melanie. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that's, I'm not seeing any new questions coming in into the channel. So I think that's all we had for Q&A. Okay. Great, great job, guys. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Uh, Anj, uh, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? There you yes. Go. Awesome. All right, it's a long night. Uh, we went over our uh, a lot of time, but uh, folks, thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, I believe we uh, we had a lot of interesting uh, objects, and we also added a couple uh, spontaneous things that we didn't really plan for earlier. So all uh, the the supernova explosion, for example. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for uh, the entire volunteer panel for putting this together. And uh, before we close out today's event, I just want to point out that there are um, other virtual events that we are moving uh, from our regular events into this virtual format. Uh, look out for those things and meet up on sja.net. We will have our guest speakers, our imaging meetings, our, uh, solar observing that we would do in the, in the daytime. And then we have the Astronomy 101 and introduction to astronomy talks. Um, and uh, that's it for today. Uh, thanks again. Good night. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank hey, you, Kanch, I just want to I just want to add real quick. Uh, so speaking of the speaker event, it's actually tomorrow. So if you want to join us uh, on meetup, I have the YouTube link posted and um, it will start at 8 p.m. So hope you all can join us for a speaker talk. We are talking about going to Mars tomorrow. So we, are, we have one of our speakers that has presented before for his day and he's coming back to give another great Mars talk tomorrow. Great, so, thanks for that reminder, just, yes. Just luck for that. <laughs> yeah. Sounds exciting. And then Sunday we have a solar astronomy event so you can spend the whole weekend doing this stuff if you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's sure. the idea. <laughs> yep. All right, good night, everyone. Good, good night. night, everybody. Good night.